Radiant Dawn is a historically controversial entry in the Fire Emblem franchise primarily because of its lack of motion controls. That said, it is a rather unique game in this series featuring 45 chapters spread out across 4 parts and a massive cast of 73 playable characters that you'll barely ever get to use because they all have very bad availability. I have held off on playing this game on my channel because of my childhood trauma from playing it on the original hardware, where the unskippable enemy phases were so long that I got frustrated and stopped playing Fire Emblem entirely for nearly a decade. But that's enough about the errors of my past. Instead, let's discuss the errors of my future. In this playthrough, I will tackle the game on hard difficulty, which interestingly removes basic gameplay features such as the weapon triangle and being able to check enemy ranges. So to make the game a bit less tedious and more interesting, without changing the difficulty too much, I patched the game to re-enable those features. Because of this game's unique structure and restrictive loss conditions, this game is probably one of the least Iron Man friendly Fire Emblem games. And so, while I do begin the run with Iron Man restrictions, I do eventually end up dropping them entirely, which is something I don't normally do. But once you discover the particular circumstances behind this, I think you'll understand. The game begins with a cutscene of soldiers searching for the eponymous Dawn Brigade, which is a ragtag band of Dayan rebels who fight to resist a brutal occupation of their homeland following the events of the previous game. Micaiah, our decoy protagonist, tries to hide but is soon discovered. Fortunately, the timely arrival of Soth, a recurring character from FE9, allows her to escape unscathed. We then cut to a few days later with the part 1 prologue of Radiant Dawn, which is a standard Fire Emblem bandit intro map. Here we are introduced to the Dawn Brigade, who might be among the most worthless set of early game characters in Fire Emblem history. Here we get the Light Mage Makaya, who is our lord and a strange character because trading her does not really make her more useful. We also get Edward the Myrmidon, who has roughly negative 3 lines of dialogue. And a few turns in, the Archer Leonardo also joins, and he is a complete liability in every sense of the word. The prologue is a rather simple and straightforward map, and I decided to mainly focus on training Edward who is currently the least bad unit that I have. After defeating all of the bandits as well as the boss, the Banyan soldiers show up forcing us to flee. Here the main antagonist of part 1. General Gerard is introduced, and after a small bit of expository dialogue, he decides to murder his own subordinate in cold blood. In Chapter 1-1 of Radiant Dawn, the Dawn Brigade retreats to one of their safe houses, and here we meet Nolan who is technically the Dawn Brigade's leader, even though Micaiah is much more important, which is a thematic parallel to how Micaiah is technically the skin's protagonist, even though Ike is much more important. However, unlike Micaiah, Nolan can survive more than two rounds of combat. In the midst of a discussion, Banyan so Soldiers have surrounded the hideout, putting us into an escape map with a turn limit of 10 turns, which when playing normally is just barely enough. I open the map by moving Nolan and Edward forward immediately, but forget that many of the enemies have one two ranged weapons and Edward is nearly killed. He is left with 1 HP, saved only by his defense and HP level ups in the previous chapter. While early character deaths normally will not phase me, the early chapters of Radiant Dawn have very strict loss conditions, where you will get a game over if any of your characters die. And this unfortunately means that I'm not able to play as carelessly as I usually do in the early game. After a bit of thought, I'm able to move all my characters through, defeating the enemies and escaping to complete the chapter. As the Dawn Brigade escapes, the townspeople cover their retreat by physically stopping the soldiers from following. So in response, the soldiers open fire into the crowd to disperse them which results in a child being shot. Micaiah returns to heal the child with sacrifice, her personal skill that allows her to transfer HP to other units, which saves the child's life and more importantly, grants her 10 XP. P. The townspeople once again block the soldiers from pursuing, but this time General Jared shows up and personally murders three civilians on the spot. And that's bad. In Chapter 1-2 of Radiant Dawn, the Dawn Brigade escapes the city, and on the road, they encounter the priestess Laura, who asks them to help recover medicine that Benyan soldiers have stolen. And to do this, we take a detour to Ray the mansion where these ill-gotten goods have been stored. On this map, we get Laura, who is the only healer that you get for the entirety of Part 1, who, under normal circumstances, cannot fight. I begin the map by using my units to block the ledge to the top, preventing melee enemies from attacking me, and use Nolan to block the enemy to the right at the choke point. A few turns in, we get Soth who is a strong pre-promote that can very easily carry part 1, but generally you don't want to do that because you want to feed her XP to your weaker units. 
Because my Path of Radiance transfer file was kind of useless because everyone died, in addition to being on the wrong version of the game, I decided to grab a transfer file that I found on GameFAQs, giving Soth significant transfer bonuses, but funnily enough, this changes surprisingly little about his utility because he's basically invincible in part 1 anyway. And his limiting factors in later parts are his stat caps which are bad and cannot be overcome in any way. I cleaned the chest in the lower left to obtain the Thani Tome, which is Makaya's personal tome that can allow her to one-shot enemy armors and cavalry, which once again sounds really nice but doesn't really do much because there are only a few chapters where it is relevant. I take out the boss with Edward to give him more XP and move Laura to the arrive point to complete the map, but in the closing cutscene Laura suddenly disappears and when Makaya goes to find her they are both captured by General Jared. In chapter 1-3 of Radiant Dawn, Makaya and Laura are imprisoned for around 21 lines of dialogue before Soth shows up to break them out. During their harrowing and lengthy incarceration, they meet a bunch of merchant characters from the first game, as well as Kurth Naga, who in the now discontinued Fire Anthem Cypher card game is a 4 drop that once per turn can fetch a 5 cost card from a retreat pile at the cost of only one bond flip, which is very efficient when compared to similar effects. This chapter's objective is to move Makaya to the arrive point at the bottom of the map, which essentially makes it a route map for all intents and purposes. Most maps in Radiant Dawn have bonus XP rewards for completing maps quickly, but the amount that you get is often so insignificant that it doesn't matter. At the start of the map, we get Eliana, who has the best availability in Radiant Dawn and benefits from transfer bonuses, but despite this, she still struggles a lot because magic is not very good in this game. I have Soth move to the left to handle the initial wave of enemies as I shovel everyone else to the right. After fighting a few enemies, I lure in a conveniently color-coded enemy soldier and have Laura talk to him to recruit Aaron, a soldier that is about as good as the other Dawn Brigade members, which is to say, not very. I continue clearing enemy reinforcements, feeding kills to Edward and Nolan until I find a solitary archer who I surround. On a whim, I decide to distribute XP more evenly and try to have Leonardo do chip damage, only to discover seconds later that Leonardo gets one shot by archers on this map. Needless to say, this does not go well and Leonardo is instantly killed on the counterattack, triggering an immediate game over, because having any player character die at this point is a loss condition. At this point, I was still trying to iron the game, so I started from the very beginning, this time skipping all of the dialogue, disabling animations, and making extensive use of the emulator fast forward feature to make up for lost time. But playing too fast also has its downsides, especially because I was extremely tilted. While the first run lasted around 2 hours because I was reading the dialogue, the next few attempts went much quicker. The second run lasted around 4 minutes from start to finish because I accidentally got my Kaya killed by a soldier in chapter 1-1, and the third try was even shorter, lasting around 3 minutes before I got Edward killed by a bunch of axe guys. Unfortunately, I took it a bit slower in the fourth attempt, and I got back to chapter 1-3 in around 12 minutes. I followed the same general strategy as before, though this time I decided to play more safely, and didn't even try to use my less useful units. I soon managed to clear the map and move everyone to the escape point for a reward of around 200 bonus XP, which can give a promoted level 1 unit as much as 9 experience points which is clearly something worthwhile and definitely not an inconsequential rounding error masquerading as a reward. In the closing cutscene, the traveling merchants decide to join us, giving us access to the shop, and they also tell us of a rumor of the late King Ashnard's son, who resides in the desert, so we go there in order to move the plot along. In chapter 1-4, Radiant Dawn, we head into the desert and enter some ruins because Kaya has a hunch that there's something interesting inside. After entering the ruins, Soth goes on a tangent to gush over his hero, Commander Ike, while Makai is a little annoyed because Ike was the one that destroyed their country in the previous game and brought about the current state of affairs. Moments after discovering a large amount of treasure, we were ambushed by Lagoo's bandits, who are led by two guys that have the typical bandit boss duo look. This map features a bunch of healing urns, which provide free and infinite healing to both allies and enemies, making this a very popular early grinding map to train Dawn Brigade characters. However, because of the early failure of the past three runs, I decided to hold off on grinding until later stages of this playthrough. Starting from this map, we get Meg, who is a sword armor with the growths of a Myrmidon, and whose main feature is the fortune skill, which can be removed and sold for 3,000 gold. I start the map by having Nolan and Edward block the bottom of the map, and once the goo start breaking through the upper walls, I reposition Edward there to hold them off. After holding off a couple sets of reinforcements, the map calms down. I have Soth grab all the hidden treasure on the map, but in my haste, I accidentally move too fast and route the map too quickly, causing me to miss out on the Seraph robe in the upper right. After routing the bandits, we find the target of Makaya's plot-progressing premonition 
Revolution, which are several lagoons, including the Lost Heron Prince Raphael, who gives us a quick summary of the Serenus Forest Massacre to catch up the people who didn't play FE9. Soth suggests that they seek out Ike to reunite with their lost kin, and Makai responds with what is perhaps one of the funniest lines of dialogue to come out of the English localization. In Chapter 1-5 of Radiant Dawn, the Dawn Brigade continues searching the desert and finding Banyan soldiers who are attacking recurring characters from the previous game. This is a defend map where we must protect those allied units for 6 turns. On this map, we get Volug, who is a very useful part 1 unit, but just like other strong part 1 units, he is basically incapable of getting any real amount of XP. The only real way to make him better in part 1 is to grind his strike rank by having him repeatedly attack enemies, but I figure that if I'm going to spend time grinding up a unit, there are more humorous options. I open the map by having Soth, Ileana, and Volug handle the enemies to the north, and block the ledge with my weaker units to stop the enemies from climbing down. Most of your army probably won't reach the green units before the time limit expires, but if you can defeat enough enemies around them, that's generally enough to keep them alive and complete the map. One of the big benefits of using a strong save transfer Soth is that he has much higher defense and resistance than usual, allowing me to throw him into otherwise risky situations. So I take advantage of this by having Soth dive directly into the boss, allowing me to sweep the entire right side of the map. The turn limit quickly expires, and the green units are saved with relative ease. After defeating the soldiers, we are able to find the target of our search. We first meet Azuka, whose character design clearly indicates that he is a purely benevolent character with only our best interests in mind. And through him, we are introduced to Prince Peleus, King Ashnard's son, whose triumphant theme music invokes the impression that future events in the story that involve him will not be tragic in any way. In Chapter 1-6 of Radiant Dawn, Izuka stokes the fires of rebellion across Dayan, and we decide on a plan of attack. Akaya uses her prophetic powers to look at the wiki page for the location of future maps, pinpointing Terran as a favorable target. Starting from this map, we managed to recruit the three green units that we had to defend in the previous chapter. The first is Toroneo, who is a general that is basically invincible in part 1, but after this map, he leaves and cannot be deployed for 23 chapters. And while this sounds like a bad joke, these huge availability gaps are extremely common. The second unit is the Hark, who is a swordmaster that is better than Edward in almost every way the moment that he joins. And the third is Joe, who is the only flying unit that Micaiah gets and is one of the better units in the Dawn Brigade. That said, later in the game, Sahark and Joe can betray the Dawn Brigade, but there's no reason that any rational player would ever allow that to happen. Fortunately, I am a player that is not shackled by the constraints of only making good decisions. This map mainly features enemies approaching from multiple directions, as well as Pegasus Knights that spawn in from various parts of the map. Though at this point you're absolutely flooded with strong units like Soth, Volug, Torneo, and Sahark, who can all clear the map very easily, and I let them do so because it's safer and faster that way. Generally in Radiant Dawn, lower level units can be trained more easily and quickly by using one of many degenerate grinding methods instead of actually using them in combat. On a completely unrelated note, this is the first map in the game that features enemy staff users. In Radiant Dawn, staves can provide a passive healing effect to their user, meaning that enemy healers are a commonly occurring, environmentally friendly, and renewable source of free XP. And so, to support the cause of green energy, I leave a single healer alive so that Leonardo can repeatedly shoot him several hundred times for XP. Other units will quickly become too strong and be able to kill the healer in one round, but Leonardo manages to stay weak enough that this does not happen. After running through my stock of bronze bows and hitting the XP falloff point, I managed to train Leonardo to level 17, and while many of his stats have improved considerably, he still only has 20 HP. In the second part of chapter 1-6, we continued the attack, but the Banyan forces, in desperation, take civilians hostage to try to dissuade us. One of the enemy commanders, Fiona, finds this to be abhorrent enough to mutiny and betray Banyan by rescuing the hostages and abandoning the battlefield. With this, all of the forces under her command become green units. Unfortunately, all of these cavaliers are incredibly weak and have their stats further reduced by the rescuing penalty, so they stand no chance against the enemy forces. Fiona herself in particular is even weaker than the other NPC cavaliers, and on this map, her death is a loss condition, which is not great because there is a non-zero chance of her dying without you being able to do anything about it. I open the map by setting Toroneo and Sol to block the bridge to the left, while the rest of my forces attack the enemies at the ballista. Leonardo, despite having basically no HP, has surprisingly gotten to the point where he can one round enemies. After the initial enemies are cleared, I shift Soth and Zaharak to the right to save Yona and prevent a game over from occurring. After this, I push forward on the left flank, moving on to secure the objective, which is defeating the boss. I decide to skip out on farming the remaining enemies for XP and just have Toronil kill the boss to end it quickly, giving us the Paragon Scroll as a reward. Paragon doubles experience gain, but comically, it requires too much skill capacity to be equipped on any tier 1 unit except for Makaya. 
area, which significantly limits its use. In the closing cutscene, Fiona throws her lot in with the Dawn Brigade, allowing her to use the incredibly underleveled and underpowered Cavalier for a total of two maps in Part 1. In Chapter 1-7 of Radiant Dawn, we move to free Dayan prisoners from a large work camp, and to do this, Izuka proposes poisoning the water supply, a plan that Makaya vetoes because of the possibility of collateral damage, as well as the insignificant little detail that it is extremely unethical. This is one of the slower paced maps of Part 1, which gives ample opportunity to train units because of a large number of stationary enemies. A few turns in, we get Tormod, Morim, and Vika, and they're strong for now, but they sit in a strange middle ground where it's hard to find a reason to use them. They can't be trained in Part 1 because they're too high level, and if you just want to clear maps, you get units that are much better for doing that very soon. And this is all made even worse by the 24 chapter availability gap that they have after Part 1 ends. I slowly and methodically clear the enemies, and repeatedly use Sacrifice on Micaiah to gain 20 XP a pop because of the Paragon skill, until I manage to reach the boss, who sits on a healing tile and is a very popular target for XP grinding methods. I think about trying to train Meg, but unfortunately her strength is too low to even damage the boss, so instead I train Leonardo and Edward and manage to get both of them to promotion. I then finish off the map by training Micaiah, but she accidentally crits and kills the boss, cutting her training a little short. She managed to reach level 17, but despite this, she is extremely slow, having only gained a single point of speed across all of her level ups, which does not bode well for her survivability. In Chapter 1-8 of Radiant Dawn, General Jared panics because the occupation forces will soon be investigated and his crimes will come to light. The only way out for him is to completely eliminate any witnesses, so he spreads news of a max executioner to lure in rebel forces, to try to take him out in one fell swoop. Micaiah's forces arrive at the advertised location, where large numbers of Dayan prisoners are shoved into the swamp by super soldier bandits who have ridiculously high stats. This map is unique because of its very large number of mandatory characters, as well as preventing you from deploying Jill for no reason other than the fact that she would have been useful here. On this map, we get Raphael, a heroin dancer who can refresh 4 units per turn, as well as Nyla, the Laguz Wolf Queen who is absurdly strong and can carry the entire map. Suffice to say, beating this map is not particularly challenging because of all these strong free units, even though all of the enemies have been scaled up to a ridiculous degree. I have the force deployed Tormod to clean up enemies at the bottom while Morim and Vika sit on their thumbs and do nothing because they don't have enough transformation meter to transform and fight. I manage to protect most of the civilians while handling the enemy bandits and wyvern reinforcements, and then find myself another prime grinding opportunity. I have Meg repeatedly attack an enemy healer to train her stats, and once she becomes too strong, I use Nyla's glare ability to petrify that healer, paralyze them, but also giving them plus 10 defense, which allows the grind to continue. By repeatedly attacking this petrified healer, I get Meg to her level cap and promote her into a sword general with stats that are superior to Edward's in pretty much every way. With that, I finish off the boss and end the map. In the closing cutscene, Dayton soldiers cheer Makai's victory, hailing her as the Priestess of Dawn, hopeful for their bright future. Perhaps one might call this a Radiant Dawn. In Chapter 1-9 of Radiant Dawn, Jared discovers that he has been sold out and will be used as a scapegoat for all of the crimes that he actually personally committed, so he decides to go out in a blaze of glory by going on a suicidal attack to kill Micaiah. Meanwhile, the Liberation Army celebrates their victory with a grand banquet. Micaiah excuses herself from the celebration and enters a dark forest where Jared and a squad of his soldiers are waiting. Jared moves to kill Micaiah, but she is suddenly saved by the Black Knight who teleports in to block the blow. This is a fog of war map where we have to defend Micaiah from unseen enemies, and to help you with this, you gain control of the Black Knight who is a mysterious an imposing figure that is uh, literally invincible. Sadly, you cannot trivialize the map by having the Black Knight rescue Micaiah because that command is explicitly disabled for this map. Unfortunately, Micaiah's low HP and defense generally means that you can only take at most two hits before dying. This is made worse by the fact that many enemies have a lot of speed. Despite being at a reasonably high level, my Micaiah has missed pretty much every speed level up, and with only eight speed, she'll get doubled and one rounded by every enemy on the map. It's been a long time since I last played this map, and I had never previously played it with a Micaiah that dies in one round. This, paired with the fact that many enemies spawn all over the place within the fog of war, makes this into a puzzle map that is very difficult to complete on the first try. So I try to compensate for my lack of experience with this map by looking up reinforcement tables on wikis and referencing YouTube videos. So I get through the first few turns just fine. The Black Knight slays Jared's minions, while Micaiah dances around trying not to get hit. But inevitably I mess up and a reinforcement archer that I had not yet seen emerges from the fog of war and shoots Micaiah 
killing Kira in one hit and ending this Iron Man attempt, wasting all the effort that had spent training crappy Dawn Brigade units. After the failure of a very promising run on 1-9, I immediately started from the beginning again, but because of my frustration, I played quite poorly, resulting in many failed runs. After taking a break, I started the game up again the next day, this time with a clear head and a clearer plan for all of part 1. And this time, I figured that if I was going to do any particular grinds, I ought to do one that requires at least effort and has the highest payoff. In order to train physical units like Meg and Leonardo, the most common method is to buy many bronze weapons to repeatedly attack healers or bosses for chip XP. This works for a while, but the XP you gain quickly diminishes as you gain level, so from a time and cost perspective, you can only reason get these characters to slightly pass their tier 2 promotion. In other words, this is a grind with a high cost and a low ceiling. I did some digging and I remember that in Radiant Dawn, staff XP gain is static and is not affected by things such as your character's level. So in other words, staff grinds will always progress linearly, which in the long term makes them much faster than weapon grinds which will slow down as you level up. This also means that staff grinds can also bring you to the level cap, which is not normally feasible with weapon grinds. In part 1, the only character that starts off being able but use staves is Laura, and in regular play, it's frankly not worth even trying to train her. However, if grinding is on the table, then Laura is probably one of the best picks. And this is because staff grinding is incredibly resource efficient. To gain 20 levels and promote once, you need 2000 XP, which is around 182 heal staff uses, amounting to a total material cost of 4.5 heal staves, which is 3640 gold. And once Laura reaches tier 2, she gains enough skill capacity to equip the Paragon skill to double her XP gain, so she can gain the next 4 40 levels to reach our level cap with another 182 staff uses for a total cost of around 7,280 gold. Spending 7,280 gold and 364 turns to get a tier 3 level 60 unit is a ridiculously good deal, creating an incredibly strong unit for a relatively small amount of effort. Comparable grinds to the level cap with physical units will probably take around 10 times as long and cost 10 times as much. So for the next playthrough, I set out on this task, this time not bothering to train the other Dawn Brigade units. So I send some to handle much of the early game. I focus on having Laura heal her way to her tier 2 promotion by the end of chapter 1-6, after which I get the Paragon skill from the boss, which doubles her XP gain. I make extensive use of chapter 1-7 stationary enemies to allow Laura to repeatedly heal for XP, letting her reach her tier 3 promotion to become a saint. I finish off her grinding in chapter 1-8, capping her level and turning her into a tier 3 level 60 saint, maxing out most of her stats and making her into an absolute monster. The entire the entire process of finishing most of part 1 while also getting Laura to this state only took around 3.5 hours which is very fast. On this playthrough, my Makaya ended up being a lot faster, allowing her to survive one round of combat in chapter 1-9. I still enter the map relatively blind and Makaya was attacked several times, but the leeway I had for Makaya not being one shot allowed me to easily survive the chapter. I sweep up the enemies with the Black Knight and have him defeat Jared to complete the map. As chapter 1-9 closes, one of Jared's lackeys takes a killing blow for for him, and Makaya foolishly decides to show mercy only to moments later immediately realize that she messed up. In the chapter 1 endgame of Radiant Dawn, General Jared decides to make one last stand by attacking Dayan's capital, taking control of the keep and bombarding the castle town with artillery. This is the final map of part 1 where we get multiple overpowered units that can roll through the map with ease, such as Nyla and the Black Knight. Suffice to say, at this point I have little patience for training Dawn Brigade units, so I simply allow the overpowered pre-promotes run wild. I have Nyla slay enemies as she moves up the ledges on the left, and have the Black Knight one-shot soldiers as he moves up the stairs on the right. I leave Laura behind at the starting area so she can slaughter reinforcements to farm a bit of weapon rank. After I make my way through the map, I manage to trap the enemy thieves and have Soth take all of the loot. Soon, the entire map is cleaned up and the only enemy remaining is Jared. Anyone can kill him at this point, so I decide to have Laura beat him to death with a staff. Staves in Radiant Dawn can act as physical weapons with 1 might, 100 hits, and varying crit rates depending on the value of the staff. This can only occur on a counter attack and is based on strength, making it little more than a useless novelty in most cases. However, my Laura has 20 strength, boosted to 22 with an energy drop, allowing her to do damage to Jared who has 18 defense. I have Soth steal Jared's concoction and then equip Laura with a recover staff which grants her additional crit chance. Jared attacks and Laura counters, landing multiple strikes with her staff. 
and on the second round of combat she kills him with two critical hits. With this we have won and Dan has been liberated. We cut to a ceremony where Micaiah gets her story promotion into a light stage allowing her to use stabs which will probably be all she'll ever be good for for the rest of the game. As part 1 ends we immediately cut to a narrated TV commercial cutscene preview of the next part and to this day I am still extremely confused as to why this exists. Unfortunately by the divine intervention of a dark god my Radiant Dawn save file was corrupted and all my progress in part 1 was completely lost. Because of this particular setback, I gave up on Iron Man the game and decided to continue the rest of the playthrough without these restrictions. Because save file corruption in Radiant Dawn basically never happens, I had not thought to make save states or backups, so I had to start from the beginning once again. I executed the same strategy as my previous run and I leveled Laura to her tier 3 level cap. This time Laura still wound up capping most of her stats but notably had much higher resistance. I was able to significantly increase the speed of the playthrough, this time completing all of part 1 and the Laura grind in only 2.5 hours. With this my file was in roughly the same state as it was before I lost all my data. And so we finally enter part 2 of Radiant Dawn which is a segment of the game with very little replay value whose only saving grace is that many of the maps have fast cheese strategies. Part 2 is a perspective shift side story where you cannot use any of your part 1 units and hilariously most of the time you don't even get to use any of your new part 2 units either makes all of the maps have restrictive preset deployments. It is surprisingly difficult to actually train characters in this part and there's not much you can even do to make a long term impact going forward. In the part Part 2 prologue of Radiant Dawn, Queen Alincia of Crimea struggles with court politics after the events of the previous game and retreats into the sky to clear her head. There she stumbles on a patrol of Banyan Wyvern Knights who are intruding on Crimean airspace, so Alincia decides to partake in a little diplomatic incident you know, as a treat. This is an 8 turn survive map where we get a completely preset army with no possible variation, which is the overarching theme of part 2. Here we get Alincia who is only present in 2 of the 5 chapters of her own story and Marcia who has some of the best parts of availability by being in 3 chapters. We also had to defend 2 bird lagoos, namely Nealuchi who was old and Lian who speaks in Wingdings, the official language of the Heron tribe. This map is pretty trivial to complete and rather boring because there's just nothing that much to do. The enemies are so low level that Marcia is the only character that can actually gain any XP but even then you don't have much time to do that. A few turns in and we can recruit Har who is an amazing unit because for some silly reason Vivers are not weak to bows in this game. I have Har quickly sweep up the rest of the map making sure to take out the boss to get the only loot, a short axe whose diminutive nature is clearly an illusion to how little impact this entire part has on the broader campaign. After sating her thirst for violence, Alincia learns that the herons are looking for Ike who as of 6 months ago has disappeared and abandoned all of his responsibilities to become a wandering vagrant. In chapter 2-1 of Radiant Dawn, Alencia invites the lagoos to Meliar which stokes discontent in the Crimean court. We then shift perspectives once again to a small town where the farmers Nephany and Brom discover that the locals are being radicalized into rebelling against the queen. They try to talk the villagers down but are forced to fight when the crowd turns on them. This is another map with priests deployments where we start with only 2 units, Nephany who can be useful when trained and Brom who has the disarm skill which is only questionably useful but is incredibly funny because you can use it to steal equipped enemy weapons. A few turns in, Heather the thief shows up to steal valuables amidst the chaos and I send Nephany to the right to recruit her. Heather has issues dealing damage but fortunately she will soon have easy access to a source of infinite XP. I clean up the map and have Nephany kill the boss who reveals that the mastermind behind the plot is Duke Ludvek who is the main antagonist is a part 2. Having just learned of a grand conspiracy and also because massacring their neighbors makes sticking around kind of awkward, Nephany and Brom decide to travel to the capital to warn Alincia of this treachery. In chapter 2-2 of Radiant Dawn, Alincia receives the information which confirms her already existing suspicions of Duke Ludvek's plan but is unable to act without solid proof. So we shift perspectives once again to her retainer Lucia who decides to go and gather information. On her trip we get our first glimpse of Ludvek who is primarily notable for looking extremely smug. Lucia manages to find direct evidence of the conspiracy but is soon ambushed by Duke Ludvek's men, leading to the beginning of the map. This is a 
Fog of War chapter, where we must escape to the upper right, we get a bunch of new units, namely Lucia, who is strong on this map, but is unusable for the next 20 or so chapters. We also get Leith and Mordecai, who I refuse to use long term, because Lagoo's transformation meters are one of the most insufferable mechanics in all of Fire Emblem. My initial moves are to huddle all my units in the upper left, which allows me to turtle until all the reinforcements are exhausted. I do my best to train Nephany, but unfortunately, she only manages to gain a few levels before she completely runs out of lance uses. And this is because even though we're halfway through part 2, there still has been no shop access in the battle preparations. The remaining maps of part 2 do not have convenient training methods, so I decided to take advantage of the only one that remains, which is training Heather via a steel loop. This is a classic Fire Emblem training method exclusive to Thieves. There is an enemy thief in the lower right of the map, allowing for this trick to be used. I start the process by placing an unarmed Braum in range of the thief to break his weapon and then begin the loop. The thief steals items from Braum and then Heather steals from the thief, gaining a static 10 XP per steal before trading all the items back to Braum to begin the cycle anew. After around 40 minutes total of steel looping, I manage to max out Heather on her tier 3 class. As a level capped Whisperer, she is temporarily formidable but will only have limited usefulness in the endgame because of her low strength. In the closing cutscene, Lucia returns with evidence of Duke Ludwig's plot, but the act of gaining the evidence has forced the traitorous noble's hand. Now unable to secretly sow discord in the shadows, Ludwig decides to rise up and open a revolt. Chapter 2-3 of Radiant Dawn is known as Jeffrey's Charge for a variety of reasons, the most obvious of which is that it is a set of instructions on how to play the map. But that is not its only meaning. Here, Jeffrey charges Ludwig with treason. So in other words, Jeffrey's Charge could also be this accusation. After this, Alencia commands Jeffrey to lead a military force against Ludwig, so Jeffrey's Charge is also this particular responsibility. Jeffrey is notably ready to do so immediately, so Jeffrey's Charge can also refer to his energy levels which are sufficient for the task at hand. In the battle preparations, we finally have access to the shop, where we can purchase weapons and items. As the commander, Jeffrey is in charge and has control of the Royal Knight's finances, so Jeffrey's Charge also refers to the fee that he is paying for equipment. Upon arriving on Ludwig's castle, Jeffrey's plan is to break through the main gate, and decides the best way to do this is to rush straight in. So in other words, Jeffrey's Charge also refers to his overall battle strategy. Now that we know what Jeffrey's Charge is, let's talk about the gameplay. It's not good. This map features an absolute ton of allied units, making it very slow and boring to play, and even with combat animations turned off, each enemy and ally phase can easily take several minutes to complete. This is fine if you're emulating because you can just fast forward, but to this day I still have vivid memories of how tedious playing this map was on native hardware. In addition to Jeffrey, we get a whole bunch of new units, but trying to use all of them is not very rewarding because most of the enemies are low level, making it hard to gain experience, and pretty much everyone has a huge availability gap after the next chapter, so even if you train any of them, you don't get that much out of it. And so my plan is to just have Jeffrey charge in. I give him javelins and move him up as far as I can, while leaving everyone else behind. The NPC units engage in an extremely drawn out melee with the enemy forces, cleaning up most of them, without any input on my end. Once I get Jeffrey to the fence choke point, he manages to sweep a huge number of foes on enemy phase, allowing me to proceed. I move him to the right to secure a speed wing and then spam end turn a couple of times so that the other units catch up. With them in rage, I break open the gate to the boss and then kill him in one round with a brave lance, allowing me to seize and complete the chapter. With this, Jeffrey has charged and completed his charge and as he bursts into the castle to lay out the charges against Ludwig, he realizes that the duke is not there. In fact, Ludwig only left a small amount of his troops as a decoy so he could launch a surprise attack on Queen Alencia with his elite forces. In the chapter 2 endgame of Radiant Dawn, Ludwig captures Lucia while she was gathering information and launches an attack on Alencia while the bulk of her forces are away. This is Alencia's Gambit and this is probably one of the most divisive maps in the series because it's a grand story set piece battle which is sadly undermined by being one of the most strategically shallow maps in the game. The intended flow of the map is that you mount a defense in multiple areas and get slowly pushed back until Jeffrey's reinforcements arrive and allow you to turn the tide. But as it turns out, this map is incredibly easy to trivialize. There are two main ways to do it, and I'll elaborate on both methods. The first method is to move down to melee and defeat the boss. This is one of the most common ways to clear the map, and it can be easy to accomplish by turn 2. A one turn to clear is even possible, but that requires more setup, which I am unwilling to do. All you need to do to win is to lure Ludwig into moving closer on turn 1 with Har or some other unit, and then immediately pile on him on the next turn to kill him and end the map. This method is simple and effective, which is why I won't be using it. The 
second way of choosing this map reveals that this map's difficulty is largely illusory. It's a joke, but not the kind that makes you laugh. It just leaves you kind of disappointed. You can even complete the map with only Alencia deployed. So I undeployed all of the other characters except for Alencia, leaving only the allied yellow units. On turn 1, Marcia shows up, so I unequip her and have her fly away so she doesn't interfere. As it turns out, there are only two real ingress points that the enemies will go for, namely the ledge to the bottom and a path to the right. So if you manage to block these two choke points, then you will only face a few attacks per turn, and most of the enemies will just get stuck. I use the direct command of the tile above the ledge to make the allied units block the ledge and the rightward path, and once they are in place, I use the hold command to make them hold position. This stops the allied units from making any proactive actions, so they won't move and ruin the formation. This sadly also stops the NPCs from healing or using vulnerabilities, so you'll need Alencia to heal them occasionally with Mand or Physic. With this, this map is already 90% complete. The vast majority of enemies will just get stuck trying to path through the ledge, with only a few stragglers deciding to go around, who can be easily picked off with Alencia. Eventually, Jeffrey will arrive with reinforcements on their right to flank Ludwig's forces, but their help is completely unnecessary. A small amount of intervention is needed so Makalov isn't murdered by a Silver Raylands general, but otherwise they can just sit there and do nothing. And as long as you keep the two allied units blocking the choke points, you can easily wait until turn 15, with the vast majority of enemies stuck in a gigantic traffic jam. After 15 turns of Valencia t posing over his rebellion, Ludwig surrenders and is imprisoned. His final move is to try to exchange Lucia's life for his freedom, but just like how this map's gameplay is about the illusion of danger, so are its narrative stakes. At the last second, Ike and the girl mercenaries burst onto the scene, rescue Lucia, and ensure that everything turns out just fine. As it turns out, all the events of Part 2 were orchestrated well in advance, and Ike had hidden the shadows to find the perfect moment to intervene. And with this, Part 2 ends, and we get yet another baffling TV commercial preview for Part 3, where we play as Ike and the Grill Mercenaries. In the Part 3 prologue of Radiant Dawn, the Grill Mercenaries are hired by Gallia to assist them in war. The Major Lagoos tribes had formed a coalition to go to war against Bagnan because they have discovered that Bagnan's senators were directly involved in the Serenus Forest Massacre. Ike agrees to help and attends a strategy meeting. The target is a Bagnan border fortress, and the plan is to make a surprise attack at night through secret passages. But midway through the meeting, the Gallian general Skirmir loudly declares that strategy is for losers and decides to attack immediately. And with this, we finally leave the glorified intro part to enter the Grill Mercenaries arc, which is where the game finally starts to become interesting. The Chapter 3 prologue of Radiant Dawn is a map with several dozen NPC units, and it easily completes itself without your intervention. So, I would like to correct myself. The game becomes more interesting after this map. Here, we get all of the Grail mercenaries, who are too numerous to go through individually, but to be concise, most of them are pretty good, even without investment. We are tasked with taking out fire mages and manning the ballista to assist the allied units, but they really don't need the help. The real purpose of this map is to try to race and kill as many enemies as possible before the allied units can steal your XP, but I just choose not to do so. I let the Lagoos take out all of the enemy forces, and Skrimir enters the arrive point to complete the map. The four is captured, and the girl mercenaries ponder over the scale of this war, and whether or not it will be enough to result in the release of the Dark God from the Medallion. Which, I would like to remind you, is this game's version of the Fire Emblem. In Chapter 3-1 of Radiant Dawn, the Lagoos Alliance presses the attack, but they have no idea how to attack a fortified position. So, Soren is tasked with drafting a plan to take the fort by deception. Mist, Leith, and Lyre don disguises to give the Night Watchmen drugged food, which puts them to sleep. With this, we begin the map where we have 12 turns to route all of the guards so we can open the gate and let the main force in. This map is relatively laid back because all of the Grail mercenaries are extremely strong compared to the enemies that you face. This is in stark contrast to the Dawn Brigade, who were clear underdogs. Hopefully, we will never have to play as them ever again. I start considering which units I want to train for the next few chapters because I need to make plans for my endgame team composition. Oscar, Rolf, and Boy are all of particular interest because they are one of two sets of units that can execute triangle attacks, allowing them to perform guaranteed critical hits with 100% accuracy if they are positioned correctly. So I do my best to give the brothers some XP and route to finish the map. With this, we open the gate, allowing the Galleon forces to capture the town. As the chapter closes, several of Ike's former companions join the team, adding Ileana and several Part 2 units to our army. In Chapter 3-2 of Radiant Dawn, the Banyan nobles' forces are scattered and disorganized, making them easy to defeat. The plan is to have Tabar install the Banyan Central Army while we sweep up the northern forces. Fortunately, Tabar has the trustworthy Ney Sala by his side, whose history of treachery is surely not a direct indicator of treachery in the imminent future. 
for this map, we get the silver card, giving us a 50% discount for all shop items, which is great, but it only lasts for this map, and we only have so much gold to work with. Ileana, Heather, Nephony, and Brom join our army at this point. Ileana keeps her inventory from her days in the Dawn Brigade, allowing for a transfer of items between armies. I made sure to bring the Paragon skill and several gems to sell for gold. I use my shop discount to load up on weapons, and I give the Paragon skill to Rolf, so I can train it more effectively. This is a very open map with a defeat boss objective, and it begins with several waves of aggressive enemies who are easily taken care of because most of them can be one-rounded by many of the girl mercenaries. I do my best to give Rolf as many kills as I can, but it's quite difficult because the enemies are too aggressive. After handling the initial wave, I move over to the right where a mage with a bolting tome is stationed. Bolting is not normally obtainable in Radiant Dawn and can only be stolen from enemies. However, the tome only appears on a few chapters and is extremely heavy. Fortunately, since I grinded Heather into a level 60 Whisper in part 2, she has more than enough strength to steal the tome. I move Heather close to the bolting mage, forcing him to switch to his other tome to attack. And so, on the next turn, I'm able to steal the bolting tome, even though it isn't really that good and is only useful for a mediocre endgame cheese strategy. After this, I continue progressing the map. I lure in the boss and surround him until he breaks his weapons, allowing me to grind out the remaining enemies unbothered. There are a couple of healers on this map, allowing for a perfect opportunity to train Rolf. I have him repeatedly shoot the healers to gain XP until the XP fall off becomes too severe and I managed to get him to level 17, where his stats are actually pretty good. In the closing cutscene, reinforcements from the central army have unexpectedly arrived, so Ranulf recommends a retreat. But General Skramir refuses this advice, so Ranulf decides to fight him to try to get him to change his mind. After Ranulf gets his ass kicked, Skramir actually decides to make the wise decision and retreats. Meanwhile, the commander of the Benyan central army, General Zelgius, observes these movements as he looks on, clearly unburdened by the responsibility of having having to maintain a secret identity or multiple sets of differently colored armor. In Chapter 3-3 of Radiant Dawn, we found out Nesala has led Tabarn into a trap, and while doing so has also slaughtered most of the Hawk tribe off screen. I don't know about you, but I'm starting to think that Nesala might not be very trustworthy. Meanwhile, the war continues and Sora informs a plan. His strategy is to simultaneously attack the Central Army and the Banyan Senator's camp to disrupt the chain of command. In a surprisingly well-animated CG cutscene with shockingly bad English voice acting, Ranulf decides to go for the boss kill and attacks Zelgus immediately, which is an interesting maneuver considering that he can at most only do single-digit damage. This map has a rather unique objective where we must burn all the supplies on the map within 15 turns. It's particularly notable for featuring actual horses as units which I find to be very humorous for no particular reason. I move across the map to burn supplies, making extensive use of Har, who has also rejoined as of last chapter. His flying mobility lets him burn supplies much more easily than most of your other units. Several Banyan senators appear, and we're told to keep them alive as a side objective, so I have Heather steal their items and then choose to kill them anyway, just because I can. As I burn the last set of supplies at the far end of the map, I suddenly realize that I forgot to burn the supplies at the start of the map, so I I have to hurry and rush Har back downwards, and I just barely manage to fulfill the objective before the turn limit expires. Meanwhile, Zelgias has predictably defeated Ranulf, but is forced to withdraw when he learns that the senators are under attack. Sadly, he is forced to walk all the way there because someone with only one identity could not possibly have access to methods of teleportation. In Chapter 3-4 of Radiant Dawn, the Laguz Alliance has gained ground but has yet to inflict any damage on the central army. This time, the strategy is to lure the enemy in so they can be flanked from multiple sides. But this strategy falls apart entirely when Zelgius challenges Skramir to a duel. Skramir, of course, accepts and rushes off to 1v1 Zelgius, forcing Ike's group to pursue him so they can rescue him. This is a rather unremarkable map where we must have Ike and Ranulf arrive at the top of the cliffs. But there's no time pressure, few actual threats, and not much in the ways of loot. But if you think about it differently, this is also one of the rare opportunities in Part 3 where we have all the time in the world to use XP grinding methods to our heart's content. The Grail mercenaries have two healers, Riss and Mist, and just like Laura, they can both benefit greatly from staff XP gain. For my purposes, I figured 
that Mist is slightly more useful to grind because her tier 3 class gives her a horse, greatly increasing her mobility. So I give Mist the Paragon skill and fill her inventory with heal staves. For this map, we get Randolph, Kaiza, and Lyre as new units, but unfortunately, they are all Laguz units, and so I will not use any of them. After defeating the initial waves of enemies on the map, most of the remaining foes just sit there and are not aggressive until you move into range, allowing me to lure them out individually and have Mist repeatedly spam heal. My setup is to move her around with an unarmed Shinon, whose provoke skill greatly encourages enemies to attack him even though Mist is also in range. This allows for easy healing without the need for a more complicated setup. With this, I'm able to power level Mist into a level 60 Valkyrie in only around 15 minutes. Once I clear the map, I have Ike and Randolph arrive at the top to complete the chapter. Despite spending more than 200 turns waiting for Mist to completely cap her level, we somehow arrive just in time to see Skrimur get bodied by Zelgius, whose unique combat animations are definitely not shared with another character because that will be ridiculous. Zelgius decides to spare Skrimur and chooses not to crush the Alliance because the Apostle will want a peaceful end to the conflict. But unfortunately, the Apostle has been unreachable for some time, indicating the possibility of an internal power struggle in the Empire. In Chapter 3-5 of Radiant Dawn, a three-day ceasefire is declared and the Laguz Alliance goes into a full retreat. However, some Bagnon forces decide to launch a surprise attack in violation of the agreement and the Grill mercenaries are forced into a hasty defense. This is a 10 turn defend map that can either be played normally or be trivially completed by having Ike stand on the seize point. However, if you only deploy Ike then you will miss out on an energy drop which can only be obtained by stealing from the boss. In normal circumstances, obtaining this energy drop is rather difficult because Heather would require significant assistance to survive and reach the boss to steal it. But because I have a level 60 Whisper Heather, she has more than enough of void to dodge any attack made against her on this map. So for this map, I deploy only two characters. Ike stands on the seize point, doing absolutely nothing, while Heather goes hunting. If Ike has enough defense, then he can easily survive even without any healing, because the first enemies that move in are a bunch of low damage sword masters. All of the remaining space will also soon be filled with one range enemies who can't attack him, so Ike will take very little damage every turn. Heather is able to easily move past enemies using her pass skill and takes no damage because she has more avoid than they have hit. And even though her damage output is pretty pathetic, she's able to kill a surprising number of enemies by activating her mastery skill Bane to reduce enemy HP to 1 before killing them with a follow up attack. I move her to the boss to try to steal the energy drop but it's a bit of an arduous task because the boss constantly runs away and has a small retinue of guards that constantly tries to surround him, making him difficult to access. After chasing the boss for a few turns and killing a few guards, I eventually manage to pin him down and steal the energy drop. I also take a detour to steal a meteor tone from an enemy mage and use the rest of the map to abuse the disarm skill, which I have equipped to Heather. The disarm has a chance of unequipping enemy weapons on hit, allowing Heather to simply take them on the following turn. But because of the skill's low activation chance, I only managed to steal two weapons before the map's time limit was up. Meanwhile, at the fort, Ike has managed to survive all 10 turns without doing anything, and with this, we complete the map and the Banyan forces stop their attack. However, all is not well because Zelgius soon finds out that the Apostle Sonaki and Chancellor Sephiroth have both been captured in an apparent coup by the Banyan Senate. In Chapter 3-6 of Ready and Dawn, we shift Perspectives once again back to the Dawn Brigade. Pelius commands Mikai to attack the Laguz Alliance on behalf of Banyan, and out of a sense of duty to her newly liberated country, Micaiah asks no questions and goes ahead with the attack. As the Lagoos Alliance tries to retreat back into Gallia, Micaiah launches her attack. For this map, we do not have access to the Grill Mercenaries and must use whatever we left with the Dawn Brigade at the end of part 1. This is almost certainly a drastic decrease in the player's power level because the Dawn Brigade is almost guaranteed to be lacking. This is a fog of war map where we must defeat a very large number of enemies, all of whom are Lagoos. In the base conversations, we get personal weapons for Edward, Leonardo, and Nolan, which would be nice if I had traded them at all in this playthrough, but sadly I have not. Under normal circumstances, this can be a rather challenging map because the average Dawn Brigade Brigade member is an untrained useless loser. However, in my case, I both have a trained Soth and a level 60 Saint Laura, who are ridiculously powerful on this map. Soth's damage is surprisingly lacking, but Laura is capable of one-rounding anything she attacks. Micaiah is very vulnerable on this map, so I make use of the Savior skill, which eliminates rescue penalties. I take the skill off of Fiona and give it to Soth, so Soth can lug Micaiah around to protect her without having any problems. Since most of my low-level Dawn Brigade members are liabilities, I choose to only deploy a few units namely Micaiah, Soth, Laura, and Zahark. The map begins with us in the lower left corner, alongside 
several Dayan soldiers who will soon be killed by the Lagoos. Normally, you would just try to hunker down in the starting area, but I decided to press on the attack and move through the river to try to reach the boss to fulfill a secondary objective. Aura and Soth slaughter the Lagoos by the dozen while Zahark just tries to survive. A few turns in, the Black Knight teleports into the starting area to help Micaiah, but hilariously, all my units are on the other side of the map. Despite the significant distance between them, the Black Knight and Micaiah have a conversation as if they were right next to each other, probably because the developers didn't think that you could move Micaiah so far away. Curiously, Zahark has a unique interaction on this map, whereby talking to an enemy Mordecai or Leith, he can have a change of heart and betray the Dawn Brigade to join the girl mercenaries. This is an event that makes sense from a story perspective, but from a gameplay perspective, it's extremely questionable. It's not only difficult to accomplish this because you have to walk across the entire map without killing too many enemies, but it's also actively detrimental to your success because it causes the Dawn Brigade to lose a strong member when his roster is almost always pathetic. In some ways, this might be one of the most objectively incorrect decisions that you can make in this game, which is why I decided to go for it. I managed to lure out Mordecai and Leith on the right side of the map and carefully move in Zahark to talk to them, and after a brief conversation, Zahark switches sides and becomes an enemy unit. If Zahark dies after changing sides, then he'll be lost permanently, so I quickly kill a few more Lagoos to end the map and successfully manage to unrecruit Zahark from the Dawn Brigade. As this chapter ends, the Dawn Brigade manages to stop the Lagoos Alliance from retreating, pinning them in between the Dayan and Banyan armies and putting them into a dire situation. Micaiah starts to have doubts about attacking a nation unprovoked at the behest of their former oppressors and resolves to try to persuade Peleus to stop the war. In Chapter 3-7 of Radiant Dawn, we switch back to the Grail mercenaries who are tasked with creating a diversion so that the Galleon forces can slip away. This time, we fight against the Dawn Brigade, which poses some unique problems because I might have to deal with the maxed out Laura and Soth that cleared the previous map. This is a 12 turn defend map where merely surviving is quite trivial because the Grail mercenaries are really strong. However, I have multiple secondary objectives I want to fulfill, so I will have to expend a bit more effort. I start by having my units cross the river to reach the Dawn Brigade units, who normally do not approach you. For now, I am intentionally making efforts to not train Ike any further because I need his stats to be low to use a cheating strategy for the end of part 3. Unfortunately, I was not very knowledgeable about the terrain on this map, and as it turns out, cavalry units are completely screwed on this chapter as they cannot cross the river tiles to enter the central island. So Oscar and my only healer Mist are marooned on the other side. With this, I seem to have stumbled into a strange case where promoting Mist has actually made her less useful. Once my units make it to the central island, I make an untactical move with negative expected value. For this map, we can start a conversation event to make Jill betray the Dawn Brigade and join the Grill Mercenaries. For the same reasons as Hark, it is almost categorically disadvantageous from a gameplay perspective to do this, so I, I gotta do it. I have Horror fly across half the map to talk to Jill, convincing her to change sides, which gives the Grail mercenaries another wyvern, but more importantly, denies the Dawn Brigade the use of one of their only competent units. Meanwhile, Heather manages to breach the ranks of the Dawn Brigade, and no one there can even touch her because she has too much avoid. Even the Black Knight, who has incredible accuracy, is not able to hit her even once. So I take this opportunity to lure him out for the purposes of another secondary objective. A secret requirement for recruiting an endgame unit is to have Ike fight the Black Knight on this map. However, fighting the Black Knight is generally quite risky, and Ike will just die if he's not trained. There are several ways of getting around this, but the easiest method is to have Ike attack with a Reaper card, which is an otherwise useless item that allows physical weakness to make a pathetically weak magical attack. But the important part is that the Reaper card prevents the enemy from counterattacking, allowing this event to take place safely. After Ike has his long-awaited rematch with the Black Knight by chucking a playing card at him and running away, I focus on my third and final goal for this map, which is further depleting the Dawn Brigade of any resources they might have for no real reason other than my own entertainment. Most of the Dawn Brigade appears in person on this map, and they can be freely defeated without any consequences. However, they all retain their inventories from the previous chapter, meaning that under the correct circumstances, you can inflict consequences on the Dawn Brigade if you so choose. I have Heather move around with a pass skill and leverage her massive strength stat to steal all of the Dawn Brigade's personal weapons. She steals the Khaled Vogue from Edward, the Lunasaw from Leonardo, and the Tarros from Nolan, depriving them of their regalia and transferring them to the Grail mercenaries who have absolutely no use for them because they can't even be sold. And to put the cherry on top, I also have her assassinate Micaiah, but unfortunately she just retreats. Fortunately, throughout this rampage, it seems that Soth is stationary and Laura is stuck on heal AI, so she spent her turn as healing instead of trying to fight me. After doing all that I could to deprive the Dawn Brigade of man and material, the map timer finally ran out, completing the chapter. On cue, the Beast and Hawk Lagoos flanked the Dawn Brigade, 
forcing them to retreat. King Peleus soon learns of Achaia's failure to destroy the Lagoo's alliance and for some reason begs a Benyan senator for another chance. It seems that even though Dayan has declared its independence for Benyan, it is still not truly free. In Chapter 3-8 of Radiant Dawn, the Lagoo's alliance, desperate for an escape route, decides to go through a treacherous network of volcanic caverns to retreat. Because of the danger, Zelgius decides not to pursue, but his decision is overruled by a newly appointed commander, Senator Valtome. This leads to a skirmish in the caverns, which is another rather unimpressive route map with a lava tile gimmick. Certain tiles on this map are dangerous, and standing on them will result in a small amount of damage every turn. Despite being one of the less interesting maps in the game, it is also for some reason featured in Fire Emblem Engage as Soren's Divine Paralog, where it suffers from the exact same issues of being way too big and a slog to play through. I use the enemies on this map to train Oscar, Rolf, and Boy, which is rather simple because most of the enemies are stationary until you enter their range. However, the enemies aren't much higher level compared to the enemies at the start of part 3, meaning that XP gain is not very fast. As future maps will be harder to stall, I also take this opportunity to train the Heron Raisin. He joined all the way back in chapter 3-5, but because of various circumstances, he hasn't been very relevant until now. Herons are particularly useful for their Godder abilities, which are most commonly used for fresh ally actions. However, most people aren't aware that they gain additional abilities at higher levels, mostly because leveling Herons can take hundreds of turns. At level 40, their level cap, herons gain access to the recovery golder, which allows them to completely restore the HP and status of adjacent allies, an incredibly powerful and useful source of infinite healing that is not commonly used, but is very important for my endgame goals. So I equip Raisin with the Paragon skill and have him spam golders until he completely caps his level. After this has been accomplished, I clear the map to complete the chapter. After chilling for 200 or so turns in the lava tubes, the army finally finds an exit, but has accidentally entered the land of the Dragon Lagoos. Goldoa. The Goldoan king, Degincia, is famously an extreme centrist whose driving philosophy is to never do anything, which is on theme because that is a very common AI behavior in this game. Degincia commands that the Lagoos Alliance leave back through the volcanic caves, but Aina, a dragon Lagoos who fought with Ike in the previous war, argues that the more neutral action would be to do nothing, so the king chooses the path of least activity and simply allows the Lagoos Alliance to safely pass through his lands. In Chapter 3-9 of Radiant and Dawn, the Lagoo's army manages to make it back to Gallia, and Benyon is unable to pursue because of the mountainous terrain. They are forced to take a roundabout path through Crimean land, and after Senator Votome's request for safe passage and supplies are denied, he decides to enter anyway, raiding the countryside along the way. The Crimean royal knights ride out to respond to this incursion, and we once again change perspectives. Jeffrey and his knights return after a long absence, but I'm not particularly interested in using any of them except for Marcia, because she can participate in a triangle attack. Notably, this is the first chapter where you can unequip Paragon from both Jeffrey and Astrid, so I unequip it from them and give the scrolls to Marcio so she can transfer them over to the Grill Mercenaries. This is a rather easy defeat boss map, mostly because the units you are given can roll over all of the enemies even at their base stats. A unique feature of this chapter is that enemies will try to burn down houses, and preventing this by extinguishing the flames can earn you some easy bonus experience. I spend most of my time trying to train Marcio, whose growth is greatly boosted by the Paragon skill. I make sure to grab the stat boosters, namely a speed wing from my enemy soldier and a spirit dust which is a hidden item. Strangely, the only way to obtain the spirit dust is to have Marcia fly into the space directly behind the boss and wait multiple turns without killing him. Marcia is the only unit that can access that tile, and she does not have a guaranteed chance of obtaining the item. You have to make sure to not kill the boss, because doing so immediately ends the map. All the while, the boss has a very small chance of critting and instantly killing Marcia, which is more strange than risky. To make sure that Marcia doesn't randomly die, I place an unarmed Kirin in the boss's range to draw attacks, and managed to get the spirit dust after a couple of turns of waiting. After the battle, Alencia meets with Senator Voltome and boldly declares her neutrality in the matter between Gallia and Benyon. Voltome threatens Alencia, but Zelgius tries to de-escalate the situation by offering not to take supplies from Crimean villages, but he still intends to pass through Crimean lands and fight within his borders, leaving Alencia with a difficult choice of how to proceed. In Chapter 3-10 of Radiant Dawn, Benyon marches on Gallia from two directions, so to avoid a battle on two fronts, the Lagoos Alliance decides to attack before they arrive. 
the opposing armies clash in Crimean territory, where Crimean forces lie in wait. Alencia appeals to both sides to stand down and not fight on Crimean soil, but after both commanders refuse, she sits down and protests in the middle of the battlefield to make a statement. Tabarn is moved by this gesture and decides to withdraw temporarily, but Senator Votome decides to press the attack. This leads to a direct conflict with General Zelgius, who chooses to abandon the field, taking most of the Banyan troops with him. Despite this, Votome commands his soldiers to kill Alencia, so Jeffrey and Ike move in to defend her. For this map, we once again switch to the Grail Mercenaries' perspective, and the Crimean Royal Knights are also present as uncontrollable green units. The goal of this map is to defend Alencia while defeating the enemy forces, but the main risk that you face is that the green units might defeat the enemies too quickly and steal all of your XP. I continue to train Oscar, Boyd, and Rolf, and I finally manage to get them all to their Tier 3 promotion, giving Oscar bow access and Boyd crossbow access, allowing them to perform their triangle attack. Though even after this promotion, I will still have to spend a lot of time using Oscar to try to get his bow rank up to a reasonable level. This map is potentially risky if you take too long because all of the Crimean units will eventually move near the boss where there are several bow users that could potentially threaten Alencia, but I'm able to go fast enough to defeat them and route the map. After being soundly defeated, Veltome sentences Elgius to death for his insubordination, but the sudden arrival of the Apostle puts a stop to this execution. Empress Sanaki reveals that the war was not her will and that it was orchestrated by a grand senatorial conspiracy. Valtome tries to spin the story, but after slandering Prime Minister Sefran, is immediately silenced by Zelgius. With this, the Banyan Central Army has been swayed to her side, and as a direct result of becoming allied to the protagonists, they are now completely ineffective as a fighting force. In Chapter 3-11 of Radiant Dawn, the Banyan Central Army, Crimea, and the Laguz tribes form a coalition to assist Empress Sanaki in reclaiming her throne from the Banyan Senate, and Ike is appointed to be the commander of the joint army. After a accepting the role, Ike is given the Ragnail, which is an incredibly powerful 1-2 range sword, which contributes greatly to his status as one of the best combat units in the game. Ike makes moves to re-enter Banyan, but surprisingly, the Dayan army blocks her way. With this, we enter a reused map from FE9, the infamous Pitfall Bridge map, but this time we go in the other direction. Starting from this chapter, we get Sigrid and Tanith, who are both fine units that require some training but are useful for their ability to participate in a triangle attack. Moving through this map, is quite treacherous because of the many obstacles, and the enemy places light runes which will impede your progress, but fortunately the many flying units that you now have can make the map much easier. A few turns in, Tabarn will join as an allied unit, and he can actually easily clear the entire map on his own except for the boss who can one-shot him with his crossbow. I have previously lost this map quite a few times because of the not-so-fun fact that Tabarn dying is a lost condition. For the first few groups, I move forward with all my troops, but eventually I decide to just throw Ike at all the remaining foes. I try and vain to race against the barn so he doesn't get killed by the boss, which is a problem that can be avoided entirely by simply using the direct command to make him hold position, but in the heat of the moment, it slipped my mind. Once the barn launched an attack against the anime boss, I thought I would have to reset. But fortunately, he activated his mastery skill, Tear, allowing him to kill the boss in one hit before the same fate could befall him. After the Dayan forces have been defeated, Micaiah commands her troops to retreat against the advice of a Banyan advisor who tells her to get all her soldiers killed for no reason. Because of the stress of the situation and accumulated fatigue, Micaiah collapses and she feels that her prophetic powers are somehow fading. In Chapter 3-12 of Radiant Dawn, Peleus reveals that he has been forced to follow Banyan's commands because he was tricked into signing a blood pact, a magical plot device that binds Day into Benyon's will. If Peleus decides to disobey Benyon, then the pact's curse will be triggered, killing an increasing number of Dayan citizens every day until the country is destroyed. And to explicitly make sure that any misunderstandings cannot be cleared up, if he tries to tell anyone about this, Benyon will trigger the pact immediately. So thinks about simply leaving Dayan, but Micaiah can't bear to abandon her country, and for now, continues to fight for Benyon to buy time while Peleus scours the royal library to find a way to break the pact. As Benyon forces pass through Dayan, and Micaiah lays an ambush, using Dayan's favorite tactic of rolling objects down cliffs to attack their foes. For this chapter, the objective is to defeat 40 enemies, which is roughly around half of the enemies on the map. Most of the foes are stuck in a big valley area to our lower left. The general layout is that there is a cliff path to the left where we can defeat enemies easily because of high ground advantage, and a wider area to the right where enemies will flood in in large quantities. There are a very large number of allied Dayan soldiers present on the map, and they will chip away at the enemy's numbers, but they probably aren't enough to beat the map on their own. Fortunately, after being unusable for more than 20 chapters, we finally regain control of Torone 
male, who is still quite useful at this stage in the game. On the other hand, most of my dog brigade units are completely useless, especially since I sent away Zahark and Jill to the Grail Mercenaries. So for this map, I bench pretty much everyone and rely on Soth and Laura. Fortunately, a level 60 Saint Laura is more than enough to make up for any deficiencies. While she's technically not invincible, it's very easy for her to take on massive amounts of enemies every turn. I have her charge down the cliff to the right and she kills everything that she touches, and is soon able to slaughter half of the Benyan army by herself. After we defeat enough of the enemy forces, Micaiah decides to execute the next phase of her diabolical plan. Aeon soldiers pour oil down the cliffs onto the Benyan forces and get ready to set them all aflame. The Holy Guard tries to escape into the sky with the Apostle to avoid the incoming inferno, so they and archers target them to shoot them down. But suddenly, Tabaran flies in and grabs Soth, holding him over a cliff's edge, which forces Micaiah to surrender and abort her plan to ruthlessly set a child on fire. The coalition forces try to talk sense into Micaiah and Toroneo, but for fear of Benyan triggering the pact, all they can do is speak cryptically without explaining any of their motives. Meanwhile, somewhere far away, Zelgius uses a mysterious means of transportation to immediately find Prime Minister Sephiran and breaks him out of prison. In Chapter 3-13 of Radiant Dawn, Zelgius and Sephiran ignite a rebellion in Benyan, causing chaos in the capital and weakening the Senate's position. Pelias has discovered a way to end the blood pact, the method of which is by his own death. In your first playthrough, you have two options, but both of them lead to Pelias dying. And you'll also immediately find out that his death was pointless, because the blood packs will continue regardless. But on your second playthrough onwards, you can make a different decision. After Pelias asks Toronir to kill him, Micaiah throws herself in between them, getting injured in the process. And this spares Pelias and allows you to recruit him in part 4 even though he is frankly not very useful. Micaiah decides to continue to stall for time to try to find a better solution to the blood pact, and has the Dayan army make one last stand at Castle Knox. The coalition forces continue to be confused as to why Dayan continues to fight for the Senate even though there's an active rebellion going on in Benyon, but they decide to not waste time trying to communicate. This is a 12 turn defender map where you need to prevent enemies from reaching the top area. This is normally a rather challenging map because of the Dawn Brigade's inadequacies as well as the wide area you need to defend. However, you can also complete this map by defeating the commander of the enemy forces, Ike. Under normal circumstances, fighting him is not advisable because Ike is a formidable adversary and is difficult to access. As the map progresses, more and more reinforcements will spawn around him, making it harder to attack him directly. But my setup allows you to easily beat this map in one turn. At the start of the map, a Dayan soldier gives Micaiah a purge tome, which can be used to attack from as far as 10 tiles away. Micaiah cannot move beyond the defended area on this map, so I have her pass it to Sol, who moves down the ledge and hand it over to Laura. I then have all of the Dawn Brigade members repeatedly shove Laura to move her closer to Ike. I have carefully made sure that Ike had at most 27 speed, allowing Laura to double him at her 31 speed cap. Laura moves down the ledge to attack, and she doubles Ike with Purge with astounding accuracy, immediately defeating him and completing the map. But despite my stellar efforts in trivializing this otherwise difficult chapter, the Dayan army is outflanked by off-screen forces, which are by far the most powerful. But they are saved from total defeat when a black dragon shows up and slices the castle apart with a laser in an animated CG cutscene. This black dragon is Kurth Naga, Prince of Goldua, who is a Fire Emblem Cypher staple for many green decks, and his intervention forces the coalition forces to temporarily retreat. In the Chapter 3 endgame of Radiant Dawn, Nyla and Raphael learn that the Dayan forces have been coerced into this conflict because of the Blood Pact. So far, the near-complete lack of knowledge of the Blood Pact and his mechanisms has meant that Dayan was powerless to rebel against it, but this changes once Micaiah asks Almeida for information. Almeida knew of the Blood Pact because King Ashnard once used it to ascend to the throne. To do this, Ashnar tricked his father into signing the document, then like an absolute mad lad, activated the curse and repeatedly gambled with his life in the hopes that everyone ahead of him in line for the throne would die before he did. After winning a very large number of coin flips, Ashnar was the only one left, and to end the pact, he killed his father and ended the curse. Almeida then remembers that Ashnar also tore up the document, allowing us to discover the conditions for ending the pact. Almeida previously held this knowledge secret to protect Pelagus, who tries to sacrifice himself again, but we soon realize that we can simply kill the other pact maker to fill the conditions. With this, Dayan finally has a plan to deal with the blood pact. However, Micaiah has only now learned this critical information at a very inopportune time. With no means of hunting the senator responsible or finding the pact itself, all she can do is stall for time, till Kurthnaga decides to violate Godoa's neutrality to step in and prevent Micaiah's forces from being destroyed. We then switch perspectives back to the girl mercenaries who are flummoxed by Kurthnaga joining Dayan and by the fact that they are not privy to his rationale for doing so. 
In the battle preparations, I dumped pretty much all of my bonus experience into Marcia to get her to her tier 3 promotion. This is a highly story centric map which features an ominous counter in the upper right which pulses with a sinister heartbeat. As units are defeated, the number goes up and several cutscenes are triggered showing the increasing chaos of the battlefield as well as a growing instability of the medallion holding the dark god. This map basically does complete itself because the counter progresses quickly from all of the NPC combat on the sides of the map and every enemy and ally phase takes quite a while to resolve. I focus most of my effort on training Marcia, Sigrun, and Tanith who all have the Paragon skill equipped. And finally, after many maps of planning, I execute my first triangle attack against some random Dan soldier. As the number on the counter goes up, the heartbeat becomes louder and several characters start hearing voices. And once the number reaches 80, the map immediately ends. Everyone converges to a small building where the medallion is being held, which is becoming unstable due to the bloody conflict going on outside. With the steel on the medallion becoming dangerously close to breaking, our heroes decide to release a dark god inside the fire emblem. With the Galder of release, instead of allowing it to wake up by war, mainly in the hopes that the consequences will be lessened. Sonaki tries to sing the Galder of release, but it doesn't work because she only sang the melody, and Mikaya shows up adding the lyrics before we the Galder successfully. But since I played the game with the music volume turned all the way down, I did not hear any of this, and this entire cutscene was just an extended period of awkward silence. For a brief moment, it feels like everything will be fine, but suddenly a gigantic orbital laser fires from the sky, its golden hue instantly enveloping everyone on the battlefield. Ike goes out to survey the situation and finds that all of the warring soldiers have been turned into stone. With this, part 3 ends and we get yet another TV commercial preview for part 4, which are technically spoilers for the next part, but it's all out of context so you probably won't understand it until you actually play the chapters. In the part 4 prologue of Ready and Dawn, everyone in the world has been petrified by godly magic, leaving only our player controlled characters unstoned. This is because of the protection of Yune, goddess of chaos who is currently possessing Micaiah and speaking through her. Yune explains that her counterpart, Ashera, the goddess of order, has judged humanity to be unworthy because of their years of warring over the past centuries. In order to save everyone, we will need to defeat Ashera who is located at the Tower of Guidance far within Banyan. With all of this exposition settled, Yune grants Ike his promotion and soon after he also learns that the Black Knight's true identity was General Zelgius, which is a surprising revelation. Ashera has recognized the danger of our plucky band of misfits and has decided to unfreeze some Banyan forces to serve as her disposable meat shields. Part 4 is structured in a unique way, wherein we split our forces into three separate armies called the Silver Army, Grill Army, and Hawk Army, led by Makai Ike and Tabarn respectively. Each of these armies will handle two maps each. Unfortunately, I do not actually have enough competent trained units to fill up all three armies, so I will have to split my useful characters between the three. In anticipation of the maps that each army will have to face, I send my flyers Heather and Laura with Micaiah's army, and the Oscar boy Rolf trio to Alincia's army. I allocate nobody of any worth to Ike's army because with his promotion and the Ragnail, Ike is strong enough to simply solo both of the maps that his army would face. In the part 4 prologue, you control Micaiah's forces in a massive route map against 64 enemies, and this is probably one of the more difficult maps of the part. Every army gets a couple of strong characters to round out your forces, and for Micaiah's army, you get Nesala and Skrimir. Skrimir is a solid filler unit and Nesala is quite strong, but unfortunately you can't depend entirely on him because he is vulnerable to bows and crossbows, which are very common on both of the Silver Army's maps. The main feature of this map were batches of enemy cavaliers that attack from the upper left and lower right. I block off one side with Skrimir and Nesala and then organize my Pegasus Knight to set up triangle attack ambushes on the lower right, allowing me to defeat the incoming reinforcements as they arrive. After the initial waves are handled, I pivot my flyers to the top lane, abusing Kanto and Heron action refreshes to wipe out the remaining aggressive enemies. I watch out for the enemy crossbow users and purge bishops, who can sneakily one-shot some of your characters and take them out before that can happen. With this, the remaining forces can be slowly lured out and defeated individually, allowing me to complete the map. Ashera's troops, now known as the Disciples of Order, were a lot stronger than expected, mainly because Ashera herself had blessed them to increase their power. And in the closing cutscene, Yune grants Soth his tier 3 promotion into Whisper, but despite this in-story power boost, Soth will be pretty much useless for the rest of the game. Curiously, it also reduces his luck stat because his tier 2 luck cap is higher than that of his tier 3 class. In chapter 4-1 of Radiant Dawn, we switch to the Grail Mercenaries, or rather the singular one Grail Mercenary who was also traveling to the Tower of Guidance. After camping for the night, Disciples of Order suddenly
randomly teleport in to attack. In theory, you're supposed to field a large and varied army to face these foes, but I have decided to allocate exactly zero resources to this group. While the other armies get strong pre-promotes as crutch characters, this one gets Ike, who is a rare example of a crutch protagonist. Ike is one of the best combat units in the entire game because of his high stats and the Ragnell, a 1-2 range legendary sword with high damage and a plus 5 defense bonus. Most of the enemies on this map deal physical damage, and they are no real threat to Ike. There are a couple of mages who can be a concern because Ike's resistance is low, but they can be dealt with with pure waters and careful play. I decided to use both the Grill Mercenary maps to power level Ike, who has just recently received his tier 3 promotion. To do this, I equip him with the Blossom skill, which halves XP gain, but in exchange, it rerolls all missed stat growths for each level up, giving him many more stats per level. Ike slaughters the entire map for experience, using Vulneries and the Ether skill to heal. All I really have to do is carefully watch out for the mages to make sure I don't fight too many of them every turn, and very quickly the map is cleared. After defeating 67 enemies, Ike has managed to reach level 9 and is on track to cap most of his stats. In Chapter 4-2 of Radiant Dawn, we change perspectives to the Hawk Army to face off against a route map featuring 71 enemies and several story elements that are not interesting enough to elaborate on in this video. In brief, this is yet another travel chapter where the group is predictably ambushed by teleporting enemies. The Hawk Army has the Barn and Alencia force deployed and both of them are strong enough that clearing the map is pretty easy. I try to focus on training Alencia because she is able to triangle attack with the other Pegasus Knight Flyers. Early in the map, Prince Peleus joins the army as a playable unit if we didn't kill him in an earlier cutscene, but he's really weak in reference to how ineffectual and useless he is in the main plot. With the addition of Oscar, Boyd, Rolf, and Raisin, I managed to defend in the map's early area and then move on to clear the map, most of which consists of stationary enemies. I crawl through the map, ringing it for XP like moisture out of a dirty rag, and I spend way too much time grinding on healing enemies and using heal salves with Lincia for relatively minor benefit. The boss of this map, Valtome, has a Valtome called the Val Aura, one of the few player obtainable weapons in the series that can inflict poison. Unfortunately, despite its unique effect that could be game breaking in other Fire Emblem titles, the Val Aura has no value because there's basically nothing useful or interesting that you can ever do with it in this game. In Chapter 4-3 of Radiant Dawn, we switch back to the Silver Army's perspective for one of the most unpleasant desert maps in the entire series. As the group marches through the desert, Makai and Sanaki converse, discovering that Makaya's prophetic powers are eerily similar to that of a Banyan Apostle. Then, suddenly, as if on cue, Vice Minister Lacane, the architect of most of the Tellius duology's tragedies, teleports in to loudly declare Sonaki to be an imposter because the true apostle of this generation, her sister, was assassinated many years ago. This is a desert realm map with 74 enemies, and the entire map is covered in sand, resulting in a significant movement penalty for most units that are not flyers or mages. Fortunately, I have brought my flyers and mages, who can steadily chip away the enemies with hit and run attacks. Much like most of Part 4, this map isn't particularly challenging but is an absolute slog and a true test of your patience. On turn 5, the Black Knight warps in, slaughtering a good number of enemies, and at this point you can simply spam end turn to wait for the Black Knight to slowly move around and kill everything on the map. However, since I want XP for my units, I try to defeat the enemies before he can steal all of the XP. This map is also full of hidden treasure, most of which is of questionable usefulness. Of particular note is the Dragon Foe skill, which grants the user effective damage against dragons, which is exclusively useful on one single map that can already be trivialized in many ways. I also make sure to recruit the hidden character Stefan by having Micaiah step on a very specific tile, giving us a strong pre promote and a very strong weapon, neither of which I will end up using for anything. After eventually routing the map, the Black Knight tries to get Micaiah to go with him to the Tower of Guidance via teleportation but refuses to explain anything. Micaiah understandably asks questions, but since the Black Knight lacks social skills, he decides to warp away to avoid the awkward situation. In Chapter 4 4 of Radiant Dawn, we switch back to Ike's perspective. The Grail Army shelters in Senator Oliver's old mansion, who was supposedly executed for his crimes in the previous game, but has apparently been secretly kept alive. We are also reunited with Tormod, Warim, and Vika, and they finally become playable again after more than 20 chapters of inavailability. That said, by now, they are all extremely underleveled and functionally useless. This is even demonstrated in a cutscene where Tormod finds that his attacks are ineffective against the Disciples of Order. And this is another route map, this time featuring 116 enemies which is frankly just ridiculous. There are a lot of mages as well as a sleep staff user on this map who can cause a lot of trouble for Ike, but with the correct positioning and a callous disregard for human life, it is not impossible to beat this map with Ike alone. Tormod, Vika, and Morim are auto-deployed on this map. 
but unfortunately they are all useless and they are a complete liability. Keeping them alive would require significantly more effort than I am willing to expend, so I just let them all die. Tormod is immediately one rounded by an archer, Mika is killed by a critical, and Wordman is hit repeatedly until his transformation meter runs out, after which he is immediately killed. By heartlessly sacrificing his former compatriots for a marginal gain, Ike is free to move to the most defensible spot on the map, that being the ledgers on the upper right. By having Ike sit on a ledge, many of the enemy mages will attack from lower ground, drastically reducing their accuracy. This allows Ike, who is normally weak to magic, to fight very favorably against many mages at once with his high ground advantage. By taking advantage of this choke point, I'm able to slaughter dozens of enemies at a time until all of the aggressive enemies are gone. There is one sleep staff user near the boss, which is a problem because Ike is very vulnerable to being put to sleep. The sleep status disables your actions, but more importantly, it sets your avoid to zero, making dodging anything basically impossible. So in short, being put to sleep with enemies nearby is basically a death sentence. Unfortunately, that's only if there are enemies nearby. I manage to bait out the sleep staff and wait out all three charges in complete safety outside of the range of any of the remaining foes. With victory secured, I grab all of the treasure from the chest by using some door keys and chest keys I had in storage, but most of it is honestly pretty superfluous at this point. After clearing all the enemies, I approach the boss, all Oliver, who is a meme recruitable character that forcibly recruits himself into your army if you brought Raphael. Unfortunately, I didn't bring him because keeping Raphael alive would be rather tough with my setup, so I just decided to kill Oliver instead. With this, the map ends and surprisingly, the first four characters have been added to your death counter simply because they were all more trouble than they were worth. In chapter 4-5 of Radiant Dawn, we switch back to the Hawk army for its second and final chapter, a defeat boss map which is a breath of fresh air compared to the rest of part 4 which has only been high enemy count route maps. Count Bastion shows up after a long absence, having apparently kidnapped Azuka immediately after the part 1 endgame, which is likely the reason that he was missing for all of part 3. But unfortunately, he has just recently escaped and now commands large numbers of feral lagoos against us. Part 4 is known for its massive enemy counts, but this map in particular goes above and beyond by featuring literally infinite reinforcements. But this is a good thing because it means you can very easily grind characters through your level cap on this channel. Chapter, especially characters that have infinite durability weapons, namely Alentia, Queen of Crimea, and Zabarn, King of the Hawks too. A couple of pre-promotes also join, and we get Bastion and Arc Sage and Volk, an assassin with a base strength higher than the max strength of any other knife user. Jeffrey is also available again for his first option deployment of the game, and I choose the option of not using any of these units. I deploy my core units and have them repeatedly slaughter the infinite Lagoo's reinforcements. In lieu of deploying a staff user, I use my level 40 Racing whose Blessing skill and Recovery Galdor are convenient sources of infinite healing. After killing enough Lagoos to depopulate the entire Talia's continent, I decide to end the map, and I move towards Izuka who will teleport away if we approach him. But I'm able to chase him down with Alincia and Zabarn, killing him and completing the chapter. In the closing cutscene, we discover that Duke Renning, Alincia's uncle, was not killed in the previous war, but was captured and turned into a feral one by Izuka's experiments. Raisin sings the Galdor Reaper to restore him to sanity, granting us yet another pre that I will not use. But on the plus side, the animation of Renning writhing on the ground loops infinitely during the dialogue and it's kind of funny to look at. After playing 6 split army slogs set against sizable sums of soldiers, we finally reach the part 4 endgame of Radiant Dawn, which is also separated into several parts. Nearly everyone makes it to the Tower of Guidance except for a couple of losers who are ruthlessly sacrificed for the sake of convenience. Yune has spent some time recruiting more characters who are a cause, but Ashera has also been hard at work and she has managed to recruit every single single dragon lagoos to fight for her. Our combined forces make camp at the base of the tower but are suddenly attacked by an endless tide of mindless replacement units reanimated by Ashera for use in suicidal human wave attacks. This immoral perversion of the natural order clearly indicates that Ashera is the hero of the story because of her tactic similarity to the strategies of a famous blue haired lord from a faraway land. Repeated waves of reanimated replacement units rush at us and are cut down before being respawned to die again and again. These situations quickly becomes unsustainable, so we make a plan to attack the tower with an elite force while everyone else stays outside to guard the rear. For the final part of the game, we can only bring a total of 17 units, only 10 of which we can choose freely. At this point, Makaya is granted her tier 3 promotion, which unfortunately doesn't really do that much for her or for us. This 17 unit limit is rather restricting because everyone left behind can no longer be used or accessed in any way for the rest of the game, which limits your options by a lot. It's generally a good idea to take away the skills and items of any character you don't plan on bringing, because otherwise they will effectively be lost. We are granted a couple of strong pre-promotes such as Kanegis, 
Yivka, as well as Renning from the end of last chapter, but I choose not to use them because deploying them will not advance my plan for this playthrough. I sell all of my extra items to get a truly massive amount of gold and start making max for silver and throne weapons of several varieties. With all of this preparation done, I decide on my final team. Six characters are force deployed, namely Ike, Micaiah, Soth, Sanaki, Karthnaga, and Aina Our seventh character is one of the heroines and I choose to bring Race in because he's probably the best heroine if you don't care about turn efficiency and I've also granted him up to level 40 for his additional skills. The other 10 characters can be any of the remaining units and I mainly choose the characters I have trained so far. Seven of my picks are the game's triangle attackers, namely the four Pegasus Flyers, Marcia, Tan, the Sigrun, and Alincia, and the three brothers, Oscar, Boyd, and Rolf. And even though I train them, I decide not to bring Mist or Heather because I don't think they'll be too useful. That said, for my remaining 3 units, I bring Laura, Shinon, as well as a completely unleveled Leonardo. With these 17 units chosen, I enter the Tower of Guidance to confront Ashera to decide the fate of the world. In the first endgame chapter, also known as Rebirth 1 of Radiant Dawn, we enter the Tower of Guidance, which is filled with Ashera's elite troops. The first enemy we face is Senator Lacane and the remaining forces of the Banyan Senate. Lacane holds the blood pact that dictated Dayan's actions for all of Part 3, but currently it is inert because inanimate statues technically cannot die. This is yet another typical Radiant Dawn endgame map with a route objective and 93 enemies, who are mostly high defense generals or high resistance bishops. Enemy quality has also significantly increased, creating a rather drastic difficulty spike. We can deploy all 17 characters that we chose to enter the tower and many of the initial enemies are quite close to our starting positions. There's a wide open area with a line of enemy generals to the top, while there are narrow choke points to the left and the right. I start the map by immediately pressing the attack on the left side of the map so I can secure a more defensible position. To make sure I have enough room to squeeze everyone in, I nestle all of my flyers in between the statues in the lower left, giving me just barely enough space to fit all my ground units on the left platform. And once I establish this foothold, I continue pushing up to secure the rest of the area. At this point, Lacane, the boss of this map, uses his special judge ability to cast a wide range AoE silence effect, and while it hits most of my army, it doesn't really do that much since most of my characters are physical units. Powerful enemy reinforcements start spawning in from the top and the bottom of the map, so I immediately move to block them at choke points. For the top of the map, I kill Lacane and then have Ike occupy his defensive tile, allowing him to face tank basically all of the enemies on the upper end. Meanwhile, on the lower right, I use Aina, who is really tanky at her base stats, and she's able to block the one tile choke point bridge at the bottom of the left platform. With these two spots secured, all the reinforcements get stuck, which lets me pick them off at my leisure. I use this opportunity to train a new promoted Micaiah by having her kill armor knights with Thani, and with a considerable amount of effort I even managed to feed kills with a level 5 tier 1 Leonardo. Training Leonardo on this endgame map is rather difficult because he cannot damage generals at all, and all of the bishops can counter attack and kill him in one hit, so he can only get XP by last hitting weakened bishops. But even that is surprisingly risky because even with his personal weapon, his accuracy is not very good against endgame enemies. And I even go as far to use Raisin's Bliss Scalder to maximize his battle rhythm, but even even then, I have to gamble repeatedly on 80% hits for Leonardo to start getting levels. It takes quite a while, but eventually he gets out of the danger zone once his levels improve his accuracy enough. After clearing all the reinforcements, I moved to take out all of the remaining stationary enemies, and after a considerable amount of effort, I was able to level Leonardo around 20 times, getting him into his tier 2 promotion by the end of the map. After all of the enemies are defeated, we finally recover the blood packs from Lacane's corpse, and Micaiah immediately destroys it, freeing Dayan from its curse, and also including the Blood Pact's plotline in a rather unsatisfying way, because it was already upstaged by an even greater calamity and then was basically ignored for 6 chapters in a row. In Rebirth 2 of Radiant Dawn, we ascend the tower and encounter the Black Knight, whose identity is no longer a surprise to anyone anymore, because they probably got spoiled directly by Fire Emblem heroes. 3 years ago, Zelkius killed Ike's father to see if he had surpassed his former master in swordplay. However, he was disappointed by how easily he won, so he went through a convoluted a multi-year process to develop Ike into a powerful swordsman for a greater challenge in a similar way to how I play Fire Emblem in convoluted ways to make the game more difficult for myself. Zelgius creates a barrier to ensure that his fight with Ike is one-on-one, -on -one. and Laveo, Zelgius' biggest fan from Part 3, shows up on the other side to face the rest of our army. 
The goal of this map is to defeat the Black Knight, which can only be done by Ike, but it's honestly rather easy and quick to do. But if you go too fast, you will not be able to defeat Leveo for the Wishblade, which is the strongest 1-2 range lance in the game. Thus, Ike begins his climactic duel with the Black Knight by putting on a pair of boots and running around like a goddamn clown, continually staying out of the Black Knight's reach to drag out the fight. There are an incredible number of enemies on this map, though only 32 of them start on the field, and 91 arrive over time as reinforcements. This map is very open and has little terrain, making it difficult to funnel XP, so fighting all the reinforcements is more trouble than it's worth. I open the map by letting the enemies approach and then unleash a disgusting amount of triangle attacks to repeatedly one-shot and utterly wipe out the first wave of foes. With this excellent action economy, I'm able to outpace most of the reinforcements and push down the left side, allowing me to dive with the boss rather quickly. Laveo is a trickier boss than most because of his 1-2 range wishblade, resolve, and impale skills. Resolve can drastically and suddenly boosts his speed, bringing him out of doubling thresholds mid-combat, and Impale is a potentially lethal 4 times damage multiplier skill. This can be avoided by using Nihil to disable his skills, but I decided to handle it by killing him in one hit. To do this, I set up a triangle attack with Oscar, Rolf, and Boyd. The Three Brothers triangle attack is a bit different from the Pegasus Knight triangle attack because it has different rules of activation. Instead of only being activatable at melee range, it can be used as long as all three of the brothers are in range with their bows or crossbows, and two are on the same row or column. Rolf as a marksman has an additional trait where he can attack with bows from 3 range with reduced accuracy. But the trick is, he can also triangle attack from this extended range, allowing him to ignore the distance penalty and land a 100% accuracy guaranteed critical hit from outside of normal counter attack distance. With cap strength and the powerful double bow obtained in the previous map, Rolf is able to one shot Laveo with absolutely no risk or even a chance for failure. Once Laveo dies, we get the wishblade but the map doesn't end. I continue swooping up as many enemies as I can but the reinforcements start getting a little hectic, so I decided to wrap things up. I have Ike stop running around as if this were a Looney Tunes cartoon, so we can have the ultimate duel against Zelgius, a battle for the ages between the Holy Swords Ragno and Alandite, which is not what happens because the Black Knight is actually weak to armor slaying weapons now. This fight is less of an honorable duel and more of a Denny's parking lot brawl, as Ike gives the Black Knight an undignified end by beating him to death with a hammer that he got on sale at Home Depot. In Rebirth 3 of Radiant Dawn, we continue the climb and our next opponents are literally every single dragon in Telius. This sounds intimidating, but considering the dire state of Godoan demographics, it only amounts to around 60 individuals in total. This map pits us against very strong and tanky dragon lagoons, but fortunately this map is a joke difficulty wise because it is extremely easy to cheese in many ways. At the start of the map, Yune will bless the top weapon in every character's inventory, granting them the ability to overcome Ashera's blessing, but more importantly, it grants these weapons infinite durability. This is particularly useful for low durability weapons that would otherwise be impractical to use, such as Siege Tomes. We have a Purge Tome from 3-13, and I also managed to get a Bolting Tome from Chapter 3-2 by having Heather steal it from an enemy. Bolting is a Lightning Tome, meaning that it does effective damage against dragons, which is literally every enemy on this map. If I brought more mages, I could trade it around to repeatedly use effective Siege Tomes a comical number of times per turn, but honestly I don't even need to do that because Mikaya can also surprisingly do very well with the Purge Tome, because you can use her Sacrifice skill to safely reduce her HP into Wrath range, drastically increasing her critical chance, allowing her to do a lot of damage at 3 to 10 range. And there's even more cheesy bullshit that you can pull, such as using the Dragonfold skill with crossbows. The Dragonfold skill makes all the user's attacks effective against dragons, granting their weapon a 3 times might multiplier, which is completely insane when combined with the high base might of crossbows. The strongest crossbow, the Arbalest, has 38 base might, which becomes an insane 114 might. And with this, even an underlevel Leonardo can one-shot endgame dragons. Funnily enough, there are also cheese strategies that you don't even have to do any preparation for, because you could completely trivialize the map with the characters that you are forced to have. More specifically, Kurthnaga and Aina are basically invincible on this map because none of the enemy dragons will try to attack or even counter attack against them, meaning that you can freely use them as non-invincible body blockers or should up just have them massacre all of their own people. I open the map by aggressively pushing to the left, making extensive use of percent activation skills as well as triangle attacks to secure kills, after which I make use of effective bolting and wrath crit purge siege homes to annihilate faraway dragons, while using Kurthnaga and Aina to body block everything to prevent them from approaching 
approaching me. After all the mobile dragons have been taken care of, I do a quick sweep to take out all the stationary enemies, which as always is very easy. With this, we have pretty much killed every single dragon except for the ones that have names. Nasir and Gareth are two such dragons that can be recruited if you don't kill them, which is not difficult to do because they are unaggressive and don't move. With this, the only enemy remaining is the Jinxia, the Dragon King. He has very formidable stats with extremely high damage and defenses, as well as a considerable amount of regeneration every turn. His attack deals 75 damage, which will straight up one-shot most units and is basically guaranteed to kill anything else in two hits. And furthermore, his mastery skill, Ire, gives him a chance to deal triple damage and evaporate anything that it touches. However, all this only applies if he manages to actually launch an attack, which can only happen at 1-2 to two range because he is a completely stationary unit and will never move. So I decided to take advantage of this by using Siege Tomes as well as my 3 range triangle attack setup. I have Sonic -E deal a bit of chip damage with Bolting as I move Boyd, Oscar, and Rolf into position. And from there, I just keep triangle attacking repeatedly from 3 range. Outside of the boss's counter attack distance until he dies. After being defeated, the Ginsia laments his mistakes and confesses that Yune's poor reputation as the Dark God was the result of a centuries-long propaganda campaign that he concocted in the hopes that it would scare everyone into avoiding war. However, as we can see, it didn't work. As it turns out, having a national policy of literally doing nothing ever is not an effective means of accomplishing anything. With the Ginsia's death, Kurtanaka becomes the new King of the Dragons, which is a bit weird because he just now had a hand in killing every last one of them. In Rebirth 4 of Radiant Dawn, on, our final opponent before confronting Ashera herself is Seferan, Prime Minister of Benyan, who has orchestrated every major conflict in order to wake the goddess. For this purpose, Seferan had secretly employed the Black Knight to incite the events of Path of Radiance, and had schemed to control Dayana with the Blood Pact, which caused many of the battles in Part 3. The purpose of all of this was to have Ashera cast judgment on the world and destroy it to start it anew. Because Seferan had lost his faith in humanity after experiencing hundreds of years of tragedies. But specifically, what really excited accelerated his despair was the assassination of the previous apostle, the Serenus Fornus Massacre, and most recently when Ike kidnapped him and used him as a human shield in Chapter 10 of Fire Emblem Path of Radiance. Starting from this chapter, Nasir and Gareth join as new units but your deployment limit remains the same at 17. They are useful for their tide skills which can boost the stats of adjacent allies, and they are easy shoot-ins to replace less useful characters that you are forced to bring, such as Soth. This is a defeat boss map featuring a new enemy type, Spirits, which are magical attackers with an astounding 20 move, meaning that they can attack pretty much anyone that they want. In theory, this could be very dangerous if every spirit decided to attack the same unit, but it seems that their AI is somewhat restrained and that they will generally try to spread out their attacks. But that is a moot point because this map can be completed very quickly. I start the map by moving downwards, my units easily one running spirits with their blessed weapons, and I manage to reach Sephiran within 3 turns. From there, I set up a triangle attack, but Sephiran's spirits can protect him by taking lethal hits for him, so I have the rest of my allies clear the remaining spirits and finish Sephiran off with two more triangle attacks to complete the map. As Sephiran lays on the ground dying, Micaiah silently intervenes with sacrifice, resuscitating him and saving his life, which is something that can only happen on your second playthrough onwards if you trigger a bunch of event flags. Much like the Premier Pro project file of this series after working on it for 4 months, Sephiran yearned for death and his plan was more or less a complicated means of committing suicide. In response to this, Ike calls Sephiran a moron and that nothing he's experienced could justify his actions, which somehow convinces Sephiran to join us for the final battle. In Rebirth 5, the final chapter of Radiant Dawn, we have our final showdown with Ashera, goddess of order. Yuni attempts to convince her to stand down but unfortunately Ashera is dead set on wiping the earth clean of living things. Ike also makes a request for one final chance, but when words fail, he is forced to resort to the most convincing argument of all. Violence. Ashera is one of the more interesting final bosses in the Fire Emblem series, because unlike most other final bosses, it tends to take more than one turn to defeat her. Ashera starts the battle immune to damage, and to even attack her, we must destroy 8 auras that surround her, which each have 90 HP and a damage reflection effect. All the while, we will have to deal with her powerful AoE and single target attacks, as well as spirit reinforcements every turn. My deployments for this map are pretty much the same as in previous chapters, except I have benched Soth and Sonaki to bring Nasir and Gareth. And additionally, on turn 1, Sephiran joins us to save humanity, having found hope for the world once again. However, our actions in the near future will only prove that he was actually completely right about everything, and that humanity does indeed deserve to perish. Beating this chapter is not too difficult if you try to do it quickly, because dragging out the fight is generally not favorable. Reinforcements will spawn in increasing numbers all the way until turn 100, and Ashera's AoE attacks hit your entire army and are difficult to withstand for more than a few turns. 
But the entire run has been building towards my ultimate plan for this map and I have no intention of backing down now. Normally, you must defeat Ashera by landing the final blow with the Ragnel, and any other lethal blow will simply result in the goddess surviving. On hard mode specifically, she will revive with her full 120 HP every time. While this means that only Ike can finish the job, it also means that as long as we don't use Ike, anyone else can still deplete Ashera's HP an infinite number of times. This might be the only case in Fire Emblem where we can repeatedly kill the final boss over and over over however many times we want. Killing Ashura once is not too hard, but killing her say 1000 times can actually be quite a challenge. In most normal playthroughs, people would run out of healing resources from Ashura's intense AoE attacks, but with some careful planning, I have managed to create an optimal setup that is capable of reliably and repeatedly killing the Goddess of Order ad infinitum. But before any of this can come into play, I must get through the first 100 turns of reinforcements. In normal play, you could just deal with them as you go, but if you want to defeat Ashura 1,000 times, it's smarter to deal with all the riffraff separately. The spirits are not individually powerful, but it takes a lot of effort to handle them while dealing with everything else, so I begin the map by hiding everyone in the corner to wait out and defeat all 100 turns of reinforcements. Normally, Ashero's AoE attacks would deal significant damage to everyone, making sustaining a long-term battle difficult, but her AoE attacks actually have damage falloff based on range. They will deal with 3 less damage for every tile you are away from her, and you can easily get 7 or more tiles away from her by going to the edge of the map, drastically reducing the damage you take and making it surprisingly survivable, by also making use of cover and wardwood tiles to increase defense and resistance, as well as healstone tiles for a small amount of passive healing, Ashera's attacks are basically reduced to nothing. To handle the spirits who all have a massive 20 movement, I create a diagonal wall consisting mainly of high resistance characters, and as a result, Sephiran has once again found himself being used as a human shield, just like he was in Path of Radiance. By creating this wall, I'm able to block the spirits, which lets me protect my characters with lower resistance, and I decided to use this opportunity to train Leonardo and Shinon by having them attack from 3 range with their Mroxman range bonus, allowing them to rapidly level up, but unfortunately despite going through the effort of grinding Leonardo to his level cap in the final map, he gets subpar level ups and ends up being kind of garbage. Shinon does better, but despite the effort I took to bring these two characters and train them, they will be all but useless for the upcoming tasks. As the spirits continue spawning, first one and two at a time, and then three per turn, we eventually fight nearly 200 spirits over the course of 100 turns, after which they are completely exhausted and stop spawning. I approach Ashera and repeatedly use triangle attacks to take out her auras, a rather lengthy and crude process that takes several turns. This wasn't very optimized, and to make up for my lack of plan, I repeatedly used the fortify staff to keep everyone at max HP, but soon I'm able to take out all the auras, leaving only Ashera left. This whole process of taking out all the reinforcements and auras took around 2 hours in real time, and around 100 and 8 turns. With only Ashera remaining, it would be trivial to just defeat her right then and there, but only defeating her once would not be enough. At this point, I have a bit of a grudge against this game, and I simply would not be satisfied unless I managed to defeat Ashera 1000 times. I picked this number because it's quite big and unreasonable enough that it would motivate me to optimize the process of killing God and to become exceedingly efficient at it. To this end, I have prepared 7 triangle attackers who can each do a ton of damage to Ashera, but just damage is not enough. A couple of the most important things I've considered when fighting Ashera is that she has very high avoid and she does a lot of damage. Triangle attacks are guaranteed hits, which solves the accuracy issue, but taking counter attacks from her is very undesirable and can lead to characters being killed. So far, I've managed to mitigate the effects of Ashera's attacks by being far away, but up close I do not have that luxury. Healing staffs are one way to sustain HP, but they are unfortunately a limited resource and cannot be depended on in the long term. So instead, I mainly depend on passive healing, such as the imbue and renewal skills, as well was Raisin's Blessing and Recovery Galdor, which was only obtainable by grinding him to level 40. While I do have some sources of infinite healing, it can only do so much every turn, so my attacking strategy is dependent on facing as few counterattacks as possible. My ace in the hole is Rolf, who specifically can deal damage without being counterattacked by attacking at 3 range. With a speed and strength boost from Aina and Asir, he's also able to one round a Shara with a double bow. His first attack will benefit from the triangle attack and be a 93 damage crit, which would then be followed by his second attack for 31 damage at 60-80% to 80 hit, depending on his battle rhythm. Even if Rolf cannot secure the kill, I can simply have someone else follow up, which would defeat Ashera, thus causing her to not counterattack. Additionally, a fully buffed Alencia can deal 120 damage in a turn, which is enough to knock out Ashera in one round. Oscar, Boyd, Marcia, Sigrid, and Tan can also lay in damage in various amounts to get or secure additional kills and further improve the kill count. My initial strategy is to try to get as many kills as I can in each turn. I set up Gareth, Aina, and Asir 
here in a triangle formation to buff my triangle attackers extensively, allowing many of them to double and deal a ton of damage. By using Kanto to repeatedly move my flyers around, I'm able to take advantage of these positional buffs with nearly all of my characters. With this setup, I'm able to score a good 4-5 kills per turn. Unfortunately, by having so many units near Ashira, her AoE attacks are truly brutal, and on some turns, I'm unable to get any kills simply because I need to scramble to keep everyone healed. I use my Fortify stat, which is running out of uses even after being repaired multiple times with the Hamurn, but once I run out of that, I will have to depend solely on my infinitely sustainable healing sources, which while powerful, have a low throughput. I keep going with this complicated setup for around an hour, scoring around 75 kills, but this is rather slow considering that I want to get 1000 kills in total. To lessen the tedium of performing this excessively repetitive task, I streamed this whole chapter on YouTube to a live audience, setting a hard time limit of around 12 hours if I wanted the VOD to be usable. So in other words, I would need to further optimize the setup to kill a sheriff more times per hour to achieve my objective of getting 1000 kills within this 12 hour time limit. Around this time, as I was repositioning my units, tragedy struck as Gareth was killed due to my carelessness. Because of his low speed and resistance, he is particularly vulnerable to being one shot by a sheriff on this map if he's not at full HP. This was rather unfortunate, but it was probably inevitable because I was bound to screw up at some point. That said, at this point I was in too far to reset, and my final setup probably didn't need him anyway. Using too many characters was costly in terms of time and thought. It takes a lot of time to move everyone around, and it takes a lot of healing and thinking to keep everyone alive. More units nearby means more AoE damage taken, so by reducing my setup to the minimum amount necessary, I will be able to reduce the amount of damage I take, and thus the amount of healing I will need to do. By aiming for a less complicated setup and fewer kills per turn, I figured I will be able to score more kills per hour by making each turn go by faster. For my optimized setup, I moved away all the unnecessary characters to be safe on the edge of the map, leaving only the necessary characters near Ashera. My main damage dealers were Oscar, Boyd, and Rolf, with Nasir and Aina buffing Rolf, Alencia giving Rolf some additional accuracy via a support bonus, and Raisin for his healing and dancing effects. Oscar and Raisin are able to self-sustain by healing with Imbue, allowing me to keep everyone else topped off with only Raisin's Blessing and Recovery Galder. With Aina and Nasir's buffs, Rolf is able to safely kill Ashera one to two times per turn. If he misses his second attack, Oscar can finish the job, and if I don't need to heal, I can get a second kill by having Raisin refresh Rolf. After taking some time and switching to this method, I managed to drastically increase my kills per hour from around 70 per hour to around 200 per hour. As I locked in and focused, my peak rate of killing Ashera was 258 goddesses per hour. I managed to continue at a steady pace of around 200 kills an hour, and near the 8 hour mark of the stream, after 6 hours of consecutively killing Ashera over and over, I lined up my final kills. For my 997th kill, I have Leonardo land the killing blow, Boy gets a 998, Alencia gets a 999, and finally, for my 1000th Ashera kill of the session, I finally let Ike attack for the first time this entire chapter to take down the Goddess of Order once and for all. After launching the attack, we cut to a cinematic cutscene where Yune empowers the Ragnar with her energy, starting a combat cutscene where Ike attacks and completely misses his first blow. After getting clocked by Ashera's magic, Ike attacks again, finally defeating Ashera once and for all, both ensuring the continued existence of humanity while simultaneously proving that Ashera was completely right, that humanity does not deserve to exist because of its unattended capability for cruelty and slaughter. This concludes my Fire Emblem Radiant Dawn playthrough, completed after defeating the final boss 1000 times in a row. I believe this is a new world record, but that's probably because nobody has ever had the motivation to do this before. And now for some final thoughts on the game. Radiant Dawn is a interesting game with many unique and ambitious features and memorable moments. But despite this, the game is marred by major problems in its core gameplay loop and map design that make actually playing the game not as enjoyable. Aside from the generally slow pace of its gameplay, training and using characters is both difficult and unrewarding because so many characters have very low or extremely inconsistent availability. And I think that this is because the game prioritizes using maps for narrative purposes instead of actually being interesting from a gameplay perspective. So many maps are filled with large preset deployments of overpowered crutch units. This generally reduces the variability of experiences and replayability of many early game maps, especially in part 1 and part 
part 2. As a result, a lot of the game feels very on rails, where your actions don't really affect future outcomes. This is made worse by the fact that part 3 is basically a hard reset in terms of progress once you get the girl mercenaries, who outclass basically everyone you get before them. It really feels like every time you play Radiant Dawn, you're forced to play two separate side stories before you actually get to play the real game. It's like if every Fire Emblem 7 playthrough required that you went through two mandatory Lin mode sections before you get to play Ellie Wood or Hector mode. I think that would overall harm the gameplay experience. Part 3 is undoubtedly the most interesting section of the game, culminating in the parts where you play as both sides of the conflict between the Dawn Brigade and the Grove of Mercenaries. This is probably one of the most interesting dynamics introduced into a Fire Emblem game, needing to tow the power balance between your two armies, even if it is ultimately illusory. In the various Grove Mercenary vs. Dawn Brigade maps, you don't actually have to fight your own characters unless you specifically go out of your way to do so. And then after that, Part 4 has a very unique three-way army split, but sadly the split army chapters feature some of the most uninspired map design in the game. Maybe this is controversial, but I'm generally not a fan of big flat open plain route maps where you have to fight 60 to 100 enemies. I would say that the game picks up again with the end game in the Tower of Guidance, mostly because you have more control over your army, but even then, more than a third of your units are mandatory deployments. And that said, I do think Ashera is a very satisfying final boss just because the effort you need to defeat her is quite high compared to other games in the series. All in all, I have mixed feelings about Radiant Dawn because it's a game that has so many interesting mechanics that reward long-term planning, but it constantly undercuts the value of your effort. The simple fact is, the game doesn't let you use the characters that you want to use, which is something that you can basically take for granted in nearly every other Fire Emblem game. Aside from a couple of exceptions, typically once you get a character, you can use them until the end of the game. But in Radiant Dawn, nearly every character drops in and out of availability so frequently that it is honestly disorienting. I think it's a major problem that so many characters are simply not worth investing resources into because they will leave for several chapters and then be outclassed by newly joined units when they return. But all that said, I think the final boss alone allows for an unprecedented amount of shenanigans and nonsense unmatched by any other Fire Emblem game. The lack of an upper end to the bullshit you can display in the final map is quite something, and that alone makes contriving a game-spanning plan to defeat a Shara 1000 times worth the effort, and I think there's something special about that. Anyway, thanks for watching, and if you want to see more videos like this, please subscribe or consider donating to my Patreon or becoming a YouTube member. See you all in the next one. Bye.